When the Department of Housing and Urban Development's Office of Healthy Homes and Lead Hazard Control learned that the home visit program that they had been supporting in Cleveland for a number of years was finding that these home visits for asthmatic children was resulting in a greater than 50% decrease in their subsequent hospitalizations. The Deputy Director, Matt Ammon, asked Dr. Dearborn at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine to host a pilot summit to work on expanding these home visits to serve a larger population of asthmatic patients. The HUD leadership organized and sponsored this summit and invited key people from their own agency and from EPA, the CDC, Health and Human Services, and NIH, along with key people from Ohio Medicaid, Ohio health insurance companies, and Cleveland health providers. The summit was held September 21st at the School of Medicine with speakers from Cleveland, Boston Children's Hospital, and Seattle's Health Department. It was titled, Health Insurance Coverage of Services Critical to Asthma Care, a Pilot Summit, and was meant to be the first of such HUD-sponsored summits around the country. The first presentation of the day is to set the scene, that is, to introduce the issue and to underline the opportunity that it brings. I'm sure my fellow pediatric pulmonologists in the audience will agree that today we understand asthma sufficiently well and have tools, adequate tools, that this statement is not an overstatement, but today we can say hospitalization for asthma is a failure in medical care. Now this doesn't occur because all the time because of some major difficulties. The first of the major difficulties is compliance or adherence to the medical care plan. This requires sufficient education and case management of the patient and the patient's family. The other major difficulty is that many of our patients' homes contain asthma triggers. That is, the home environment is a source of a major problem for them. It is these two components that then we would address in a home visit program. So, how large is the problem? This year, the CDC tells us that currently children across the country, that 9.4% of them have active asthma. And that on an annual basis, this costs us over $50 billion a year, mostly coming from almost half a million hospitalizations per year. So what about our own county, Cuyahoga County? Based on the youth risk behavior study in 2010, you see that both lifetime and current asthma is increased for these three ethnic groups. And if we go to the city of Cleveland, you see about the same, except as you note, the uh, Caucasian population in the city has significantly more asthma than for countywide. The important point to note is that all of these numbers are significantly greater than the national average. So there's something about the older city of Cleveland, the older housing, that is the likely source of this increased prevalence of, of asthmatic children. So what about asthma hospitalizations for these children? At the Children's Hospital in Cleveland for the year 2011, asthma was the primary admitting diagnosis for over 500 patients. And if you include it as a secondary or among the list of diagnoses for admission, it was three times that. 
a third of these hospitalizations include time in the intensive care unit. And this is a fairly small number, actually, in terms of patients that were discharged from the hospital but needed to be readmitted within 30 days. It was only about 3%. That number and this one in terms of the average length of stay at RBNC are decreased because most of these patients receive care from subspecialists, that is, pediatric pulmonologists. And for 20 years, we have had an asthma care path, which systematically addresses the, the symptoms in a way to, to improve them rather rapidly and get them out of the hospital. The average length of stay for the states or even nationally is closer to four days for asthmatic children. At the county hospital in Cleveland, we have similar numbers. That is, uh, over a three-year period, there were over 500 asthma admissions to Metro Health System. And the payer distribution for Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, you can see that the almost 80% of the patients were on Medicaid. I don't have the numbers for for Metro Health System, but it is likely since they are the county hospital that that number is 90 or greater percent in terms of Medicaid support of those hospitalizations. Well, what about a medication approach? Over the past 15, 20 years, we have developed medications that allow us to control asthma really quite well when they're used properly. So we have controller medications like aerosolized steroids that decrease the inflammation. And then if there is breakthrough wheezing or symptoms, then rescue medications like albuterol that can address the acute symptoms. In the last couple of years, there's been a new medication called Zolaire. This is a humanized mouse monoclonal antibody that directs against IgE antibodies. Now, IgE antibodies are those that bind allergens, so that if a patient is exposed to allergens and, and has the binding of the IgE and the allergen, this medication serves to neutralize it. Unfortunately, this medication is rather expensive. It requires subcutaneous injection every two to four weeks. And as I said, the costs are rather large. There's the cost of the family, and that the family has to provide uh, transportation and parking for the clinic on a frequent basis. There's uh, part of the nursing staff, 25% like of a nurse to administer the program. But most noteworthy is the cost of the medication itself. At the low end, that is injections every four weeks at the lower dose, it is still $19,000 a year per patient. And at the higher end, and as you see, 72% of our patients on Zolaire are at the higher end, that is getting the injection every two weeks and at the higher dose. This results in greater than $57,000 a year per patient for this newer medication. We can hope that the home visit program, and I anecdotally supports this, can decrease the use of this expensive medication. So the environmental approach. Five years ago, the NIH brought together their actually third expert panel to review and establish the guidelines for medical management of asthma. As a part of that set of guidelines is attention to the home environment. That is, it is essential to control the irrelevant inhaled allergens in the home. And if one does that, it can likely decrease the need for medication. 
And these home intervention programs need to be multifaceted, not just single approaches, but many approaches to address the home environment. Now, in addition to that expert panel, EPA sponsored a panel in Michigan in 2008 called the Asthma Health Outcomes Project. And CDC also put together a panel for a task force for community prevention services. And even a international program on the global initiative for asthma occurred in, in 2010. So there are four expert panels, if you will, that have recommended that the home environment, that the home visit programs need to be part of the medical management of asthma. From this, you would expect then that these home visit programs would be standard of care. But that hasn't happened because of the related expenses. And that's what this whole summit is about, is to see what we can do to bring home visit programs up across the country to a wider population to include them then as standard of care. So what do these home environment approaches consist of? Two years ago, the National Center for Healthy, Healthy Homes and the CDC brought together a panel of experts. Dr. Krieger, who's one of the speakers later in the summit, and um, Rebecca Morley, who's here in the audience, and David Jacobs, also in the audience, uh, led that. I was part of the expert panels. So what did we find in reviewing the literature that said was adequately researched to establish sufficient evidence to say things that need to be done in the home environment? Well, the first one is rather obvious. We're all aware that, that smoking produces a major problem for asthmatic patients. So a smoke-free home is very important. In addition, taking a multifaceted tailored interventions for reducing asthma morbid morbidity. Now, this is not just taking a single approach like putting covers on mattresses or pillows, but is to do that and in addition address other things in the house. Multifaceted approach. The other thing that was found to have sufficient evidence is integrated pest management to reduce cockroach allergen, particularly, but also other pest antigens. And this approach uses then uh, solid um, pest uh, materials rather than the usual spray approaches that can be problematic for asthmatics. The additional thing that was recognized by this expert panel was the problem of moisture and resulting mold, and that they needed to be addressed. The source of the water intrusion and increased humidity needed to be addressed to decrease the, uh, their irritation and stimulation of respiratory symptoms. So what about our local program in Cleveland? So we've had a Healthy Homes and Patients program for about seven years, but more recently our HUD grant ran for this three-year period. The basic program was focused uh, partially on the asthma center at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. And a pediatric pulmonary physician would then refer their patient for a home visit and a healthy uh, home inspector from Environmental Health Watch uh, would go out to the patient's home. This was also a training program in that frequently we also took the pulmonary fellow who was caring for these patients or even a faculty member to go out and see what's going on in the patient's home, both for an inspection and for seeing what could be done about it. So <clears throat> at the end of the inspection time, the pulmonary fellow, the inspector, 
and the head of household, commonly the patient's mother, would see what was found and devise an action plan to address it. The pulmonary fellow would be in charge of behavioral education, such as getting them to smoke outside on a more continuous basis, while the healthy home inspector would provide safety items. We walked in the door with a HEPA filter, vacuum, vacuum cleaner, and other items to make the home more healthy. And then the inspector would come back and provide low-level interventions. Uh, larger interventions such as a leaky roof had to be referred to another agency because of the expense. So what was the outcome for this program for the past three years? Again, this is focused on asthmatic children. And while the program uh, addressed 44 asthmatic children, we pulled out a subset of 29 of them who had been hospitalized prior to the visit. So the comparison we're doing here is the hospitalizations for the year prior to the home visit program starting and con contrasted to the year after the visit. So what was found with these 29 patients in the year prior to the home visit was that they required 50 hospitalizations almost two times a year, and that almost 40% of those hospitalizations included time in the pediatric intensive care unit, and 12% of those patients required readmission within 30 days. Now, as we are aware, coming to the Affordable Care Act, that 30-day readmission is, is important for hospitals to recognize because uh, in not too distant future, Medicaid will not pay for those readmissions. So what happened subsequent to the home visits? The hospitalizations decreased dramatically for a 58.6% decrease in hospitalizations for these patients. The hospitalizations requiring intensive care unit decreased by two-thirds. And none of these patients then required readmission after, within the 30-day period after discharge. It is these dramatic results that form the basis of why we are here today, because the need is recognized to expand this beyond a, a small grant program and use the experience that you will hear from Boston and from Seattle to underline the value of carrying these home visits out to usual standard care for asthmatic patients. So what would an optimal home visit program look like? It would make sense to target the program to the more severe patients. That is the patients that have required hospitalization and probably the patients who have been prescribed Zolaire, since that's the last ditch approach to try to attain control of their asthma. Both of these obviously would decrease, would serve to decrease the cost of this population. The program should work only with a physician referral. And in the NIH expert panel, from five years ago, a strong recommendation was that every asthma patient should have a written medical care plan, a staged approach for continuous care and for acute care. In an optimal home visit program, this written medical care plan should be checked and posted on the family's refrigerator. In addition, with the physician referral, optimally, there would be the results of an allergen prick testing. So on the basis of these referrals, then the home visit structure would address the environmental triggers 
to, and we'll be hearing about that later in the day. Uh, and importantly, give a hands-on education of the family and family members as to how to keep those environmental triggers down, to keep the pets out of the patient's bedroom, for instance. And then also part of the visit should be continued case management, medical care plan education to underline the need for the medical approaches. And then this program, these programs should be supported by a, a fee for service. That is the service providers who would be certified both in their asthma education and in their uh, home environmental approaches. Um, that that combined program needs to be supported by a fee-for-service system, not just small grant programs that can only address limited numbers, but expanded for standard of care for all asthmatics that are of this severity. So the remainder of the day gives the experience that have come from Boston and Seattle. And what I've just described in a home visit program is very similar in terms of the care plan education and environmental triggers to that that's been carried out in Boston. Our Cleveland program has been predominantly focused on environmental triggers, but we fully recognize the need to bring in the the asthma educator and continue the care plan education. And through those numbers, the people in Boston have been able to decrease their hospitalization rate to, by 85%. So let's move on to their experience. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce my boss, the <laughs> Deputy Secretary. So good afternoon, right? Is it afternoon already? Huh? I apologize. We are running a little late uh, today, but uh, I'm delighted to be with you. This is the... Uh, I haven't been to Cleveland in 15 years, maybe. So it's uh, it's nice to be back, and it's nice to be back uh, to see the great work that you all are doing, and to, to try to add our voice and, and hopefully our, our our help to your to your work. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking uh, Dr. Dearborn. I um, um, we met in passing just now, but uh, the more I, uh, I learn about the work, uh, the more grateful I am uh, and the more impressive it is. And, and uh, this work has been going on for years, decades, right? And so I'm grateful for the tireless efforts uh, and the difference that you're making in the lives of particularly children. And so, so thank you. I want to thank Matt. Matt has a passion for this work and is is pushing us at HUD to be um, as good as we can be, and we got more to do, uh, and it's um, we wouldn't be doing it without uh, without his efforts. So I want to I want to thank you. Uh, and I look, you've got an impressive uh, impressive list of speakers and others. So thanks to everybody who has already participated and who will participate in this event. Um, I'm five months into the job. <laughs> they haven't kicked me out yet, uh, but one, you know, there are there are lots of epiphanies at HUD, and some I can share, and some I can't. <laughs> um, but 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 one uh, that has really um, resonated with me. Um, is this issue of your health and your life expectancy. Um, 
being influenced not just by health care, um, but, uh, but where you live, right, and, and the role that we can play to add value to that. Uh, it's about the home you live in. It's about the zip code that you grow up in. Uh, and, um, you know, asthma is one of those places that uh, teaches that lesson over and over again and that I'm beginning uh, to learn about. In our country, you're more likely to have asthma as a child if you grow up in a home with asthma triggers, right, like mold, for example. You're more likely to have asthma if you grow up around folks who smoke, right? You're more likely to be living in conditions that can trigger asthma, if you will, if you live in poverty. And we're, this lesson is getting um, taught to me every day now over and over again, and I'm beginning to get it. By the way, I have a nine-year-old daughter with, with asthma, uh, so there's, there's a personal aspect of this um, for this for me as well. 20% of our children in this country live in poverty, costing us half a trillion dollars a year, every year. The highest rates of asthma are found among African Americans uh, and children from poor households. Reducing racial and ethnic disparities in children when it, when it comes to asthma, certainly the right thing to do for the families that are our neighbors that we love, but it's also the smart thing to do for the economy. Uh, in addition to improving the, the quality of life, we're saving families, we're saving taxpayers money, we're reducing short and learned long-term medical expenses, missed school days, lost earnings. Over 23 million Americans have asthma, resulting in annual cost or missed opportunities in the tens of billions of dollars. So we've seen results, right? We've seen ways to fight this issue. Uh, we've, we've seen through our Healthy Homes grants and efforts like HOPE 6 that children who live in homes with improved air quality and reduced allergen exposure show fewer asthma symptoms and fewer urgent care visits. Uh, with less time in the emergency room and more days in school, we know that children grow up to live healthier, more productive lives as adults. Some of the ways that we're taking action, and that's what I'm here for, uh, to say we're taking action, you're taking action, we, there are more steps to be taken. But our, our Office of Healthy Homes has awarded over $100 million in grants to address health hazards in housing, such as asthma. And over the past two years alone, we've awarded nearly $30 million in grants to state, localities, and nonprofits to reduce asthma triggers, to support critical research that tells us what's working and what we need to do better, and to support asthma interventions for families living in federally assisted housing. This is a pilot summit. We're working together. At HUD, we're using housing as a platform for improving the quality of life. But we know there's no way we can do it alone. Uh, and that's what this discussion is about today, bringing together federal, state, and local decision makers and key partners to see how in-home programs can be more widely incorporated into the standard of care of communities in Ohio and other places all across the country. We can't rely on improvements in federally assisted housing or healthy homes grants alone to reach the millions of children with asthma in homes where action needs to be taken. We just won't be able to do it by that, that mechanism alone. We need a comprehensive approach it's critical that we develop systems for health insurers to cover the cost of home-focused interventions. That's my ask. That's my plea. That's what we're here for. Um, with humility, but also with urgency, uh, it's time for action now. We need to seize this opportunity uh, to improve the health of our children 
I'm grateful to you that this is what you're wrestling with. I look forward to Matt and the rest of uh, the department trying to work with you so we can be a great partner with you in this effort. But uh, let's seize the moment. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Secretary Secretary Jones. And also thank you for your leadership and the leadership we have in this area. Mr. Shelby uh, is sitting in front from uh, the HUD local. And in the back, we have the phenomenal Paul Deagleman, who is on my staff, who uh, I would be remiss about without saying how active he is. But they really, you know, the department, and as I mentioned um, this morning about uh, having a tenant, uh, that, that housing as a platform for health as a tenant for what the department does, we had taken great strides in the department. And there is a lot more that, that what we can do. But what we do know is that we can't do it alone, and that's why everyone is here. That's why we continue to push. That's why we're very active in the field and the headquarters to reach out to new ideas, um, to spread the word, to, uh, to, to fund innov uh, innovations and things that we know work so that we can change what we're doing to better, again, support what you're doing. To your right, my left, is Dr. Peter Ashley. He is uh, on my staff. He is um, going to talk today uh, a little bit about what Deputy Secretary Jones mentioned about um, racial and ethnic asthma, uh, asthma disparities. And this is part of a, a coordinated plan at the federal level that we have put together to really lay out a concrete roadmap for how to deal with these issues. And, and really, again, looking internally, looking internally how we can improve what we do at HUD, but also looking internally in other federal agencies and what we can do together collaboratively uh, working across this critical issue. So with that, Dr. Ashley. Okay, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. It's always great to come to Cleveland. Uh, it's really one of the uh, the city that's doing the most to advance uh, healthy homes. It has been since the, the start of the, you know, the concept. Uh, so it's always great to be here. I, what I want to talk to you about is a federal effort um, to, to uh, create a plan to get agencies to do more, to move the needle in reducing uh, racial and ethnic asthma disparities. Uh, Dr. Dearborn uh, spoke about this. Uh, Deputy Secretary Jones mentioned it. Uh, it's, it's a very stubborn problem. Uh, we're, we're making um, uh, headway in some areas, but uh, this is one where we really need to improve things. Uh, this plan was released uh, with quite a bit of fanfare at the end of May. Uh, you might recognize uh, Secretary Donovan in the pictures here, uh, Secretary Sebelius, HHS. Uh, extra points if anybody can tell me who this person is. Nobody? That's uh, Nancy Sutley. She heads up the uh, White House Council on Environmental Quality. So, Dora's going to get you your prize. Right, right Dora, for that. <laughs> um, so, this is the document available on the web. Nice picture. I think a lot of effort went into creating this, and I'll talk about that. But the important thing really is implementation, isn't it? And we have no extra funds to implement this, uh, you know, what we've come up with here, the, the strategies. And actually, we're, we're in a declining budget environment. That's why it's really important that we have a, a plan to help coordinate uh, agency activities and to improve the, our efficiencies. So that's the whole idea. So this is what I'm going to go over today. A little bit about the context and uh, creating the plan, um, aspects of the plan that are especially relevant for our discussion today, and implementation. So the, um, the task, this, this plan was uh, developed under the President's uh, Task Force on Environmental Health Risks and Safety Risks to Children. This task force was first created under President Clinton, so quite a while ago. Uh, went into hiatus, and and then a couple of years ago, uh, it was reconstituted. Um, so the mission is to identify priority issues on environmental health and, and safety risks, like the title suggests, 
uh, recommend and implement interagency actions, and communicate uh, and work together with our state and uh, local um, stakeholders. So it's organized. Uh, we've got representatives from the, the major federal agencies. Uh, senior steering committee uh, directs it. Uh, the priority areas that were first identified by the task force uh, were reducing asthma disparities, what I'm talking about today. Uh, one that I took off the list was uh, chemical exposures, chemical hazards. Uh, they decided not to really pursue that. And then there's uh, uh, the area of healthy homes. Uh, we're working on a strategy now. We've been going back and forth with the uh, um, Office of Man Management and Budget. I'm getting it cleared. It's, it's a slow, tedious process. Uh, we expect it to be done, hopefully, in, uh, in maybe a month or so. And I think the, the, the healthy home strategy and the asthma strategy really reinforce each other. So the healthy home strategy will get at other housing-related hazards that were mentioned today, uh, you know, for seen uh, injury hazards, uh, lead, uh, indoor air quality, so uh, the, whole, the whole gamut. So we've talked about, uh, other speakers have talked about um, the disparities in both prevalence, uh, you know, racial, by, by race and ethnicity, uh, also uh, by income. Uh, you can see the figure on the left here. By income, uh, race and ethnicity. And then as been mentioned before, uh, it also expresses itself not in just prevalence, but in disease severity and mortality. So the the figure on the on the right is it's uh, these points are relative to uh, white children with asthma. That's the dotted line. So you can see um, uh, here increased hospitalization rates among uh, for for black children, and then way up here is um, mortality, four times the uh, rate of white children for asthma mortality. These are uh, this is data from 2003, 2004, but I don't believe it's really changed uh, that much. So that's that's why we're here. This is this is what we really have to uh, address. Um, so the asthma disparities working group was created uh, to develop this uh, this strategy, um, co-chaired by EPA, HHS, NHLBI, and HUD. Uh, I wanted to mention uh, Dr. Paul Garvey from um, CDC's. He directs CDC's asthma program is here. He was on the writing team with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Herman of his staff. Um, so what's the, what's the focus of the plan? So the plan focuses on addressing preventable factors that contribute to the disparities in the burden and severity of asthma. Um, and, and of, of those factors, um, a major one is to implement the uh, NAETP guidelines. Those are guidelines developed by experts. Uh, they were last uh, renewed, updated in 2007. Uh, the National Asthma Education and Prevention uh, Program guidelines uh, through the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, part of NIH. I'm learning all kinds of new acronyms part of this getting involved in. So um, we've got the, we know what we're supposed to do. Uh, we need to address the, these barriers to implement the, the guidelines and, and both uh, medical fair, care factors and uh, physical and psychosocial environmental factors. That's really what we're here today to talk about. Uh, also um, increasing uh, local capacity to live, to deliver uh, community-based integrated asthma care, and to uh, improve uh, identification, the identification of the, the needy populations. Use the current technology uh, to help us identify um, families or children that need intervention. Um, because a lot of this plan largely focuses on um, implementing the NAEPP guidelines, I thought it'd be useful to quickly review some of the major components of the guidelines. Um, so pharmacologic treatment, um, and, but important, most importantly for the, what we're talking about today is, is education to improve self-management skills, 
uh, reduction of and reduction of environmental exposures that we're seeing as well. So those are the two components of the guidelines I think that are most relevant to the, the meeting today. So the um, we held held a workshop about geez, I guess about three years ago this winter when we we're kicking off this process process to develop the uh, the action plan. And um, what we came up with is, is four uh, key strategies. Those are the inner part of the circle uh, that can are kind of embedded in traditional uh, federal public health functions. So development of policy, uh, surveillance research, and then um, supporting public health interventions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these uh, strategic um, areas and then the priority actions uh, within within those. Um, so the strategy one, again, this is uh, most relevant, I think, to what we're here for today. We reduce barriers to the implementation of guidelines-based as, as, asthma management. And again, it's really the NAEPP guidelines that we're, we're talking about here. Um, So you see here, um, in homes, reduce uh, environmental exposures. So something that we're, we're talking about today. But also, not just homes, uh, we need to be uh, conscious of uh, school settings. Kids spend uh, a lot of time in school. Um, so we have to also address um, triggers that are found in school, and then coordination with, uh, with health care that's delivered in school by, uh, say, school and school nurses. And also referrals from schools to um, to providers of, of care when that's needed. So strategy two uh, is really um, enhancing capacity to deliver uh, the care. Um, this is just a, I'm not going through all of the priority actions under under the strategy. Just some examples. Um, one one being is coordination among uh, programs that are going into homes, homes of, uh, especially homes of low income uh, minority uh, households, families. Um, for instance, uh, weatherization programs, um, they address, uh, they work in low income um, homes. Uh, there's an opportunity there, you know, they, what they, do is go in and improve the energy efficiency of the home. But there's been more interest, and this is something that's been pioneered in, in Cleveland here, in Cuyahoga County, uh, through their grants have been doing it, is coordinating uh, between healthy homes programs and weatherization programs. Uh, on the healthy home side, it, it, it gives the, the client uh, more benefits uh, other than just the uh, reducing uh, health hazards. Uh, it gives them more uh, disposable income, reducing the uh, what they have to spend on on fuel costs, for instance. But on the weatherization side, that's an opportunity. When you go into a home and you find out there's an asthmatic child, that's an opportunity to refer uh, to other services and and to uh, also to address, uh, say, mold and moisture and, and triggers that might not be addressed during the weatherization process. So that's kind of an exciting. Uh, I think an exciting example of what we can do, um, thinking creatively, um, you know, trying to work together uh, between federal agencies that have these home visitation programs. So, um, strategy three is really improving our uh, targeting using technology to uh, to improve uh, targeting, whether it's GIS, um, using internet cell communications, and then standardization of metrics. Uh, just, just, uh, and I was a little surprised finding out uh, this, but we need uh, to better standardize how we measure, uh, how we determine uh, asthma severity between, between different research studies, um, and then uh, surveillance. Um, there's uh, better standardizations needed uh, in this area, so we can, we can track uh, progress more efficiently, and we can compare uh, between uh, different uh, research studies, et cetera. Um, 
Timely Strategy 4, uh, the, at the workshop, we weren't going to focus on um, preventing asthma. We thought, you know, that's very difficult. Let's really focus more on, uh, you know, improving the lives of kids that already have asthma. But the, the attendees said, you can't do that. You've got to, you've got to also focus on preventing. And, and we know there's ongoing research, uh, but there's probably efficiencies to be gained by uh, better coordination between uh, federal and federal agencies. One activity um, that we're promoting um, at HUD, uh, started through our Office of Healthy Homes, is, um, is trying to promote smoke-free multi-unit housing. We know that exposure to secondhand smoke is a risk factor for the development of asthma. So uh, we didn't do this uh, solely to to improve uh, you know the lives of, of kids with asthma, but uh, there's a lot of reasons for it: uh, reduced costs, uh, reduced fire risk, reduced costs of unit turnover. But there's a lot of excitement that we might really see some benefits in uh, in health and asthma being, of course, uh, one area that we really could see it. And then maybe even uh, development of new cases. So there is some. Um, uh, there's some CDC spending some funds to look at this. Uh, Healthy Home Solutions, uh, that's uh, out of uh, Rebecca Morley's National Center for Healthy Homes, has some funds to uh, research this uh, from the CDC. So they're just getting started. That'll be uh, exciting to see what happens. Uh, so again, so uh, just kind of a, a summary of what uh, we're trying to do through the strategy, through the uh, through the action plan, um, promote. Uh, promote the widespread implementation of effective uh, practices, advance policy initiatives, and uh, collaborate on uh, research agenda. So um, we don't want a plan that, you know, it's easy to be self-congratulatory. Hey, we, we got this nice plan, but that, you know, it looks good. Uh, we've done, put a lot of work into it. Um, now we have to implement it. Uh, that's the hard part. Uh, and um, again, with a declining budget, how do we do that? Um, well, we've already um, identified what we're calling early wins. Uh, so we're looking at these uh, priority actions uh, that are under each of the four strategies. Which of those can we do, make good progress on in six months? Um, so that's what we're calling the early win. And which could help uh, would be important to help us get to the uh, longer term goals. Um, we're going to meet quarterly. Um, we're going to we're going to uh, provide updates to the the Children's Environmental Health Task Force or the Presidential Task Force on progress. So it's up to you folks in the room. Hold us to it. You know the administration. We got a lot of uh, good PR trotting the, this out, and now we have to. Uh, Put our uh, actions where the uh, the words are, where that where our mouth is. So uh, this is an example of the um, some of these priority actions, um, and we'll see what happens. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge Dr. Elisa Smith from EPA. She was one of the co-leads uh, for providing me uh, some of the slides today. She was responsible for the the nice ones, the photos and things. <laughs> Um, so uh, that's it. Like I said, keep our feet to the fire. And uh, I think what what we're talking about today is, is really critical in, in helping to move the needle and reducing uh, the, the disparities that we see. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Assey. We're going to uh, forge ahead. Um, I'm going to do a very shortened intro, which is basically, uh, Susan, Summer, please come on up. <laughs> she is from Children's Hospital Boston, and she's going to be talking about for her community asthma initiative. So I want to um, acknowledge all of the people who have been part of our team um, and uh, really has been a, um, 
an honor to be um, part of it, and I, again, also an honor to be here today. And, um, and also to um, thank our funders, CDC which has been a, just a fabulous um, program to be part of, unfortunately coming to the end of our five years um, grant. Um, Healthy Tomorrow's uh, partnership with the, asthma, the uh, sorry, American Academy of Pediatrics and uh, HRSA, um, and um, many, um, uh, many, some private foundation money. Um, Boston Children's Hospital's Office of Child Advocacy, which is the community benefits um, office within the hospital, and they've really taken it, um, community benefits to the next level um, by really not only fulfilling the requirements of the Attorney General, but really going be above and beyond that to have a vision about um, community programming and really systemic change within um, Boston and Massachusetts. Um, and I realized I didn't, leave, I didn't include our new um, funding from the CMS Innovation Grant through the Asthma Regional Council, which you'll be hearing more about in a few minutes. Um, Oops, I went reverse. Can't read. Um, so, um, speaking of the Office of Child Advocacy, every three years they do a community needs assessment, um, and um, through that process in 2003, um, identified four areas of um, need um, for pediatrics: um, asthma being number one, obesity, mental health, and injuries. Um, asthma at the time and continues to be the leading cause of hospital admissions at Children's. Um, and 70% of children um, hospitalized for asthma are from five low-income, um, predominantly um, African-American and Latino neighborhoods in Boston. So well, we're a tertiary care um, hospital. Really, when it comes to asthma, we are the, one of the community hospitals. Um, and that hospital rates for African-American and Latino children in 2003 were four to five times the rate of white children. Um, we took a population health approach um, and targeted um, uh, children ages 2 to 18 from four zip codes with high asthma rates. Um, and um, for the first two and a half years, those um, were our um, target areas, um, looking at um, all children who were either seen in the emergency department or admitted for asthma from those zip codes and um, offering them um, our program and really a tailored approach to um, improving asthma control. Um, since then, we have expanded um, to other, um, basically all neighborhoods of Boston, but um, we, and also taking um, comparable referrals from um, our um, primary care clinics um, for um, children who have other indicators of poor control, such as multiple courses of um, prednisone um, or asthma exacerbation. Um, this is, um, doesn't, I don't know how well it comes across, um, but uh, uh, sort of retrospective um, GIS mapping of where our patients come from. Um, basically 70% of the uh, um, patients we have enrolled in our program live in high um, poverty areas, um, and you can see also um, the concentration of dots um, in um, uh, the target areas, um, Roxbury and Jamaica Plain initially, but then um, expanding from there. Um, and 74% of those um, same, you know, much overlapping populations within areas that are predominantly black and Latino. So um, Boston is um, very racially segregated still, and um, you can see that there's a huge overlap of where our um, patients come from. Um, looking at the social determinants of health, um, again, why are we here? We know that probably the number one um, uh, determinant is substandard housing. Um, and unlike Cleveland, I guess, our big problem is mice, um, much more than cockroaches. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but all of the above, um, you know, mold and um, um, environmental tobacco smoke, um, school buildings with many of the same triggers, um, poverty, competing demands, you know, many of our, in the 
second they get out of um, the hospital, parents have already lost days of work um, or are scrambling to um, figure out how they're going to feed their children. Um, stress related to violence um, and racism. We have a very uh, rising rate of um, community and gang violence in Boston that has really, it's amazing how often I'm talking to someone who's you know, going on to a funeral because of someone that was killed. Um, limited safe places to exercise low, and low health literacy and distrust of the healthcare system. Um, and that includes um, um, fear and misconceptions about asthma medications, um, and especially inhaled steroids. And um, also um, very often low expectations of what good asthma control is. Um, there's a great um, uh, article in pediatrics, I think it was in 2008, by Lauren Smith, who's actually the medical director of our um, uh, Department of Public Health in Massachusetts, talking about low expectations and um, competing demands and how that impacts um, asthma control. So we um, address the um, issue um, on all um, levels of the socio-ecological model, individual and family, community. Um, we have um, educational workshops and a very successful asthma swim program in several neighborhoods. And then also, you know, from the beginning, knowing that we need to work on um, the broader issues around um, housing and schools and also how we were going to, in the long term, sustain these sort of programs. Um, so we um, developed a home visit model very similar to what's been discussed, um, focusing on the individualized needs assessment and case management by um, nurses and community health workers um, and um, barriers to good asthma control, um, tailored asthma education, so going into the home and really getting down to what is the um, family's perception of what's going on, what are the what are their understandings, um, misconceptions, uh, you know, how do they really use the medications, um, how many of the, you know, inhalers that people bring out are expired or um, have, are empty even. Um, so, you know, it really does, it's such an opportunity to see what um, people are really doing and, you know, to have the luxury, really. I used to work in a health center as a nurse practitioner and, you know, 15 minutes max. Um, and to spend an hour, an hour and a half talking to a family about their um, child's asthma is just really um, immeasurably valuable. Um, and then uh, doing the home environmental assessments um, and um, provide moderate level of remediation, um, care coordination with the medical home, asthma specialist, school nurse, and other case management and advocacy. Um, I think I already started speaking about some of this, but, um, you know, we have people bring out their meds. We really try and get an honest um, assessment of adherence. Um, and, um, you know, people are often um, really, um, from maybe their own family experience, used to going to the emergency department or thinking that that's as good as it gets. Um, so really um, getting people to the point where they realize that their child doesn't have to, have to miss so much school because they have asthma. In terms of the home environment, um, we do a visual inspection um, and identifying potential triggers, pest, mold, pest, clutter is a big issue that certainly adds to the pest problem and potentially uh, the mold problem um, and um, certainly dust and dust mites. Um, and um, the other thing that is beyond what we've talked about before is the strong household cleaners, which people are um, uh, quite um, attached to, as well as um, air fresheners and plug-ins and every, you know, brand that you can imagine. Um, so that um, the indicator for me is when I start coughing, you know, that um, things are um, pretty polluted. <laughs> Um, we provide education on integrated pest management, um, smoke-free housing, certainly on the individual family level, but um, totally um, support HUD's efforts and um, Boston Housing Authority has gone smoke-free as of this fall. Um, and some of the um, Section 8 property-based um, properties as well. So that has is making a huge impact. Um, and we do, um, you know, 
counsel people individually on their smoking habits and um, you know, hopefully move them towards um, the decision to quit. And in fact, a lot of people are actually are interested in quitting. They just um, either haven't had the tools or feel like, you know, life is too stressful and um, they're waiting for that perfect moment. Um, so, you know, we um, have been um, fairly successful in getting people, you know, moving people along that um, trajectory or even quitting. Um, and then also safe cleaning methods um, with very, you know, mild products and white vinegar and baking soda and things like that. Um, we provide every family um, with a HEPA vacuum cleaner and dust mite proof bedding and casements. Um, and then as needed supplies, um, IPM supplies, um, copper gauze to fill in holes, um, trash cans with lids, um, uh, sticky traps and other things to um, discourage um, pets from <clears throat> coming around, um, plastic storage bins for clutter, um, and advocacy with landlords, um, you know, providing landlords with the, you know, information they need to practice IPM, um, referrals for housing inspections when things aren't um, changing on a voluntary basis. And then we have, um, over the course of the um, program, um, had um, about 10% of our families um, uh, we, where we sent out an IPM contractor when things just seemed like they were too emergent to wait for the much longer process of um, inspections and um, multiple um, sort of steps that that takes to get landlords to do the right thing. Um, we've taken a quality improvement um, uh, approach to this, so it's not a randomized um, controlled trial. It's um, and um, our IRB, um, you know, basically waived um, the need for um, uh, any um, extensive um, approval process because they perceive this as, um, you know, continuation of care um, and um, enhanced care to our patients. Um, we look at health outcomes, ED visits and hospital admissions, quality of life measures, um, missed school days, parental missed work days, days of limitation, physical activity, and we've done um, an initial, um, albeit somewhat rudimentary, cost um, analysis of the program, um, looking at both um, parental report, but for the cost analysis, administrative data. Um, it does seem that most um, people that come to children's, um, come, come pretty exclusively to children's, um, and um, so that has been fairly remarkably similar to what we get, get from parental report. And we also were able, since we chose four zip codes initially, to take a demographically similar population um, within Boston, um, which we've more recently um, are seeing children from that area, but initially um, as a comparison group. So um, we have, since two th October of 2005, enrolled. Now we're up to probably 960 patients. Um, 76% uh, of uh, those patients that initially expressed interest in a home visit, the home visits were accomplished. Um, and um, mean age, not um, surprisingly, 7.3 years. Um, pretty much split 50-50 um, Latino and African American. And I'll add that our Latino population is primarily from um, Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, which I think is probably um, sort of genetically more comparable to Puerto Ricans. Um, and of those, 25% um, are um, monolingual Spanish, and we do all of our staff is um, bilingual in Spanish, and two staff members who are bicultural. Um, low income, 65%, um, uh, less than 25,000, and 72% who have Medicaid. And so you can see here, just um, year to year, this has been incredibly consistent in terms of um, who we've enrolled, and we don't like only choose to enroll um, African Americans and Latinos, but that's who is really um, showing up in the hospital um, with asthma. The um, white, um, more middle class um, children um, don't need hospitalizations, and so we um, see this as a huge um, uh, uh, issue of health disparities and. Um, environmental and social justice. Um, we've, um, over the course of um, 
the program also had very consistent um, outcomes. Um, 60% decrease in ED visits um, at 12 months and 80% decrease in um, admissions. 42% uh, decrease at 12 months of missed school days and 47% decrease of um, missed work days. 31% uh, decrease of limitations in physical activity and 57% um, increase at, of um, up-to-date asthma action plans. Um, in terms of the environmental findings, um, significant clutter. Again, if people live in very tight um, housing where, you know, the closets are full to the brim and things are overflowing into, you know, all the bedrooms, there's just not enough um, storage. Um, rodents, primarily mice, 37%, um, and then some bear pets, mold cockroaches and environmental tobacco smoke, which pretty much, in fact, the tobacco smoke reflects more or less the prevalence in Massachusetts, a little bit ahead of the game there. Um, we have the um, good fortune of having like amazing partners, many of whom have worked um, closely with HUD, um, the Boston Public Health Commission, um, and uh, researchers at um, EU School of Public Health in particular. Um, and so through their efforts, um, there is a um, program called Breathe Easy at Home, which is a collaboration with Inspectional Services, and where there is actually a web-based referral process where healthcare providers can um, refer um, households um, directly to Inspectional Services rather than having the onus be on the tenant. Um, and um, the providers subsequently get feedback um, electronically from um, inspectional services where things are in the process. Um, I've been lucky enough to be on the steering committee and it's really been um, a very um, collaborative um, process where um, there are representatives from the Boston Housing Authority who are um, as much champions of uh, IPM and uh, the and issues around um, asthma and home envir environmental triggers as we are. So it's been a very um, positive process, I think, on many um, levels, in including systemic. Um, and um, all of the um, inspector inspectors um, are promote integrated pest management. In fact, they are, you know, uh, at least on paper, require that to be the method used um, in um, remediation um, by landlords. And um, we um, have also um, medical, a medical legal partnership in Boston that's um, able to help us with some complicated cases. So the um, inspectors, um, and these are sort of results from um, cases that we've referred, 70% mouse infestations, 45% uh, mold, water damage leaks, 35% cockroaches. Um, and as you can see that over 50% um, of the households um, had more than one violation. Um, there are always things that interfere with the process being completed. Um, people don't open up their door for the subsequent inspections or move or things like that, but um, um, almost 50% of those that we referred had a clear documentation of um, violations being corrected. Um, we're also really lucky to be part of um, a home visiting collaborative in Boston. I think this is really innovative, um, where um, convened by the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, Boston, in certain ways, is rich in um, agencies doing some level of asthma home visiting, um, but everybody's sort of doing it on their own. And um, so this was a, a very successful effort to bring us all together um, and um, have um, a coordinated, high-quality um, community health worker home visiting um, program or infrastructure um, and protocol um, that was culturally and linguistically diverse so that within that coalition we have um, uh, home visitors who speak um, Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cape Verdean Creole, um, Chinese, uh, Mandarin and Cantonese so that if we at Children's have someone who um, is uh, a Cantonese speaker. We can um, we know we can refer to someone who could um, do that visit for us. 
Um, so we've um, been able, and so our goal is also um, to um, be able to get, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, we've accomplished really standardization of the home visiting protocols. Um, ideally, have a similar online referral system, um, similar to the inspectional services with, um, through the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, coordination of training is occurring, um, hopefully in the future, purchasing um, shared electronic data collection and evaluation that we have been able to um, do currently collecting um, uh, netbooks when we go into the homes, um, or the community health workers go into the homes, all the data um, having, um, which we're actually sort of in the process of moving for those who are much more um, sort of IT savvy than I am, um, switching over to the uh, REDCap um, software where this would be an on, um, online system, um, very user friendly that um, all uh, different um, providers could access um, in the home. Um, and then of course, but last but not least, coordination with payers <laughs> to get them to see the value of all this and the great um, outcomes and um, hopefully get more buy-in around um, reimbursement. Um, so we did, um, uh, we have done some cost analysis. Um, we, um, and so looking at um, 102 patients, um, we're working on sort of a longer um, time period now, but 102 patients who had um, now um, um, data up through five years post-enrollment um, that um, at um, two years um, we could demonstrate a return on investment of 1.5 um, and again and at five years um, of um, 3.09. Um, you'll notice that most of the savings is in admissions, so it certainly makes sense, you know, the approach of, you know, as, that we have done and that, that sounds like yours, planning of um, targeting um, children who have been admitted. Um, and um, adding on the social um, elements um, of missed work days and missed school days and um, calculating those costs, um, we have a social return on investment of 1.81 at two years and 3.88 at five years. The pink is missed school day savings from that and blue, the light blue missed work days. Um, we also, um, as I mentioned, were able to use a comparison um, for zip code population um, from another very um, similar um, uh, neighborhood in Boston. Um, and so that we were able to look at um, you know, because there's all those questions about um, regression to the mean as well as, um, you know, what's other things are going on in the community. You know, a lot of people are doing a lot of work around asthma. Um, so that we um, were able to um, show that while initially we um, had um, higher cost patients, um, and again, it's interesting that, you, um, Dora, you're looking at ICU um, days, and that is something we haven't done, but I think that would be a very interesting thing to add to our evaluation. Um, but after um, one year um, of our program, um, we had, we were um, equal to those um, in the other comparison population that had um, initially lower costs, and, but then as the years go on, in two years, we again had, um, the cost had dropped further. Um, whereas the comparison population had held steady. And I think it really is, um, you know, a time, um, you, the intervention, depending on the family, depending on the environmental conditions, it can take up to a year to get rid of the mice and get um, people on board with being adherent and things like that. So seeing the savings really after um, the, uh, at, at two years and beyond is um, important. So with that in mind, that the comparison group also had decreases in um, cost um, years one and two. Um, the adjusted ROI is um, at two years is 1.06 and at three years is 1.33. So, you know, we, um, we can, I think as part of our um, program, you know, initially I think our costs were higher, sort of, um, getting things rolling. Um, we've had more nurse um, 
uh, home visiting and case management than a lot of um, programs, and we are moving um, to a more community health worker-based home visiting um, system. Um, so I think we can, A, bring our costs down, um, and um, also, um, but, you know, even if it breaks even or, you know, any cost savings at all, um, it, it only gets better over time because we do see that um, people's um, uh, asthma control really, um, for the most part, um, is uh, sustained over a longer period of time. Um, sustaining the system, we're really working um, since day one trying to establish a sustainable funding um, for these sort of home visiting programs. Um, we've worked closely with ARC, which you'll hear more about their work um, around um, payer advocacy, um, working on the business case for asthma home visiting, um, uh, the coalition we work with um, took a, um, was able to add a budget amendment, or not, we were able to add it, but to, you know, um, sort of advocate and educate our um, uh, state legislators to um, add um, a pilot Medicaid bundled payment program um, for high risk pediatric asthma patients. Um, to the budget, um, so that is a mandate to Medicaid. Um, learning about all the ins and outs of what that means and how long it took to get a, a waiver in order to do that and all the changes in the um, healthcare system in Massachusetts, we're still uh, waiting in RFA, although we're reassured that there is one coming. <laughs> um, and we're working, um, you know, as um, we, um, are able to um, disseminate the model. We um, are working actually with um, a group of providers in Alabama to replicate the model in Birmingham. And um, again, um, Stacy will tell you more about the CMS Innovation Grant, which is very exciting. Um, I think we know that um, so the improved health outcomes and cost analyses demonstrate a successful cost effective model. Um, healthcare reform offers opportunities to develop novel payment approaches for care. And we need to, at all times, be, you know, cognizant and addressing at the same time as, you know, we approach the um, these issues, um, be it health disparities and social determinants of health that um, sort of drive those. Um, and this is our team, uh, some of our team and our parent advisory board. So thank you. Thanks, Susan. And uh, you, we have one more before break. And uh, you've already actually introduced Stacy. So Stacy Jacker, please come up. She's the, from the Asthma Regia Council of uh, Boston, or New England, not just Boston, New England. So actually I work at Health Resources in Action where the Asthma Regional Council is based. And I feel like actually a lot of the stuff that I was gonna talk about got talked about already, so I can <laughs> skip over that. I know some people are interested. I wasn't going to talk that much about it, about our healthcare um, innovation awards. So um, I was asked to talk about the business case for asthma, which the Asthma Regional Council has been working on for a long time, and I was going to talk a little bit about our process. Um, so just briefly, Health Resources in Action, we're a public health organization. Um, we work to help people lead healthier lives um, through, we can read it up here, prevention, health promotion, policy and research. The Asthma Regional Council, um, our mission is to help people live full and active lives, um, and we do a lot of collaborations with people. Um, we were formed in um, 2000. It was when the um, regional directors of HUD, HHS, and EPA came together to address the high prevalence rates of asthma amongst children in New England and to really address the environmental factors that contributed to asthma. Um, since then, we have expanded. It, it was at a summit. Asthma Regional Council was formed to bring together people to work on these issues. Um, since then, we've also um, have expanded to promote um, best practices in clinical practices, as well as to um, address um, asthma in adults. And we work. I think we're the only actually regional across six New England states. Um, Council that's working on asthma and has been working um, closely with the, um, each of the CDC funded asthma managers in six of our New England states, which is really highly beneficial in many different ways. Um, 
So asthma, I don't really need to talk about this because everyone's talked about this, the high rates of asthma, the disparities. Um, so I'm just going to skip this. The one thing I will say is that um, people have not um, spoken about is um, we did a CRFSS callback is that in New England, two-thirds of our population that have asthma, either their um, asthma is poorly controlled or barely poorly controlled, and that's really significant. It just really talks about how this disease can be managed, but it's not being managed. Um, this was already spoken about, the high cost of asthma, um, the 50.1 billion is from the CDC statistics, um, which is actually updated since our business case, which you have in your folders. Um, you know, there's a high cost for society, 10.5 million missed school days, that's an average of four days per kid per year. Um, it's also one of the top 10 conditions, not really rising to one of the top four, um, for why adults miss work either for themselves or because they're home with their kids, or they're at work and they can't focus on work because they're worrying about their kids who are home with asthma. Um, so one of the things that we have done in terms of promoting best practices for asthma um, is focusing on the providers. Um, the Asthma Regional Council has either done or worked with others to have um, provider um, consensus statements about what best practices are. Um, we worked with um, healthcare payers, um, and payers are both um, um, employers, large purchasers of insurance, but also healthcare insurers. Policymakers, um, pa patients, actually purchasers we pulled out, but we do consider them payers. And we feel like it's really been important to help to write white papers, to convince them of the issues, to be convening people, to be educating people, um, and really doing the one-on-one -on -one meetings to really um, get them to understand what the issues are and how they are a piece of the puzzle in really moving forward. Um, so I'm just going to focus on payers. I know that's what we're, what I was asked to talk about today. So we think it's really important, and we've been building our business cases, and ARC has been doing this since 2003, um, is really sharing what is the evidence base for best practices, you know, what kind of outcomes can you expect, you know, what costs, um, what are the standard of practices and models, and what do providers want to provide, and what are um, purchasers willing to pay for it. That last one, being large employers, is, I would say, far more complicated. Um, this is briefly our history of working with payers. I've been here since 2008, the Aspen Regional Council, and ARC has been working on this issue for far more time than that. But in 2003, um, Lori Stillman, who was the director of the Aspen Regional Council, and Polly Hoppin from UMass Lowell, started meeting with medical directors of insurance um, plans to talk about, you know, what do they know about the issue, what are they covering, um, what do they know about environmental triggers, just to let, learn the lay of the land. And we had our first symposium with healthcare payers back in 2004. Um, we built our first business case for um, payers in 2007. Um, we then on, went on to work with um, two healthcare plans in Massachusetts to really convince them to create uh, pilot programs for home visiting, which both of them to some extent still carry on today, um, addressing environmental triggers and all that. Um, and we formalized, um, since I've been here, our working relationship with our um, asthma programs across New England um, to the extent that the six New England states have had a joint strategy on promoting financing for asthma services, for asthma education and home-based services within their own individual states, but have been working jointly to look at broader strategies, which has been really important. Um, in the last six years, um, the Aspen Regional Council has developed um, a business case. You have our newest business case, which is now from 2010 in your package. Um, we also have a business case, which I did not include, um, for employers and purchasers about why they would want to cover these services. Um, we have a business case for integrated pest management. Um, also in your packages, there's an insurance checklist, which focuses on the four areas which we've been talking about from the NAEPP best best practices for guidelines. Um, again, I mentioned the provider consensus statement. I would say provider consensus statements, we now know that there's best practices that are being promoted across the United States. What it really has done is really helped to create asthma champions in states that haven't had them. So through the process of providers coming together, they've discovered their um, 
their cohorts within their own states. And um, Connecticut is a perfect example of that during their process where they were writing their provider consensus statement. In Connecticut, um, two providers really emerged as asthma champions um, and have been doing a lot of work in trying to get what's called pay for performance through their Medicaid office for asthma education offered to their clinic. And actually now they're part of our um, CMS funded grant. But it was really through that process that they discovered that they were both working on the same thing and could work better as advocates together. Um, our insurance coverage survey, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So these are some of our business cases. Um, we're actually really proud. We've been quoted a lot. Um, Secretary Sebelius um, cited our business case in a letter to all governors, talking about how to lower AFRA costs in a letter to governors um, in 2011. Um, and we have mentioned many, many, many times the NAAPP um, um, best practices and guidelines. And we, as many in this room, have been focusing on education for self-management for asthma, as well as controlled environmental factors. And the rationale for that are those of the two practices that are the least frequently covered. Um, so that's where we have focused our attention. Um, so, you know, our business case is really um, focused. We looked at a couple of random controlled studies. There's very few random controlled, controlled studies for home visiting programs. Oopsie, can I just go? What did I just do? Get me out of there. <laughs> okay, I can't sit there and look at myself. <laughs> like, what did I do? Thank you, sorry. So um, there's very few random um, control um, studies. We looked at some of those. Um, but we also looked at on-the-ground programs. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> that would be pure torture. So. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to talk, you know, briefly about some of the takeaways um, from our um, business case. And really, um, the first one is is that, you know, and this is from the CDC, looking at Paul, is that, you know, a, a combination of um, minor to moderate environmental remediation in the home in combination with asthma self-management um, is really important in terms of um, you know, increasing symptom-free days, improving lung functioning, and reducing use of rescue medications. And I think you know, what Susan talked about, and I've heard this over and over again from people that have home visiting programs, is that how often they walk into someone's home, how people dump the medication onto the table, and they have no idea what they're doing with their medication. And so how that important that has been for people to have the opportunity to actually talk about their medication, um, as well as what's going on in their home in terms of the environment. Um, when we look at our business case, we're really focusing on, you know, are there cost savings? So that's really the return on investment. So for every dollar that the healthcare industry is investing, are they actually saving some money? The concept of cost effectiveness is, are you reducing symptom-free days? So is this a reasonable cost in order to, you know, help kids stay healthy or adults, stay in school, stay at work? Um, and so it's looking at the larger cost of society of not just the cost savings. It's also comparing it to use of high-cost medications, which Dora was talking about. Um, and so what we have found through our review of literature, we are not running programs ourselves, um, is that asthma education, um, when um, asthma education, there is return on investment for asthma education. Um, this is particularly important for when you have the frequent flyer kids that are ending up in the hospital or in the ER. Um, it will result in lower healthcare utilization um, and people better understand how to control their asthma and it will lower costs. But as for lower risk patients, um, the program tends to have a, less of a cost saving. There's a cost effectiveness for that. Um, for the home-based environmental interventions, which I'm not really going to describe. Susan just gave us a fantastic description of a, um, it's, you know, the assessment and the environmental supplies and the education. It's, it's cost effective. Um, it's that, you know, you will find that their symptom-free days are increased when you compare that to the medic 
medications that are being prescribed for people that have high-risk asthma, um, you will find that there is a level of cost-effectiveness. So that is a reasonable cost, but not a particularly a saving to the healthcare system. Um, did I just skip the slide? I did. Um, so the evidence we have um, reviewed in our business case, you will find that we have several programs reviewed from on-the-ground programs. One of them is Children's Hospital that I'm not talking about today because Susan just did. Um, we also have um, promoted Jim Krieger, who's going to be speaking, I think, via webcast. Um, today, um, a lot of the programs are based on Jim Krieger's work. Um, but many programs have actually have so showed, excuse me, healthcare savings. Um, Optima Health is a program that has a both asthma education as well as home visiting services, um, and they have showed that they save four dollars and ten cents. They've been running this program for many years. Um, that's North Carolina and Virginia. Um, Monroe Health Plan actually started doing asthma education. They also have a case management system and home visiting program, um, and this is in Rochester, New York. And then there's the Asthma Network of Western Michigan, which I believe does um, asthma environmental assessments and intensive education, but not really environmental supplies, but they've also showed a cost saving. Um, there's a lot of on-the-ground programs, and since we have published this, you know, there's many that we have not captured and could be doing far more um, work in terms of that. What we have found and put in our toolbox is things that people have talked about really here already is that, you know, there's what the person needs that has the asthma that they need asthma education. You know, the low intensity kid that's really not ending up in the ER or ending up on Zola or ending up in the hospital and that they really can benefit from um, individual asthma education sessions in the clinic um, where they're learning about triggers and learning about their medication and learning about the supplies that they need at home versus the kid that's ending up in the hospital that really needs the home visit, really needs the environmental supplies, um, really needs the time in the home to sit down with somebody on a repeated basis to learn about how to manage their asthma. Their, their asthma. Um, so it's really important, and I think we've heard this today, about how to discern who needs what. Um, so our overarching recommendations from this was really well, we're getting to this later. So, you know, aligning reimbursement practices so that the people that need these services can get the services that they need, that they're in in alignment with national guidelines. You know, asthma education needs to happen both in the clinics um, and in the home for those that need it. Providing as home assessments. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I'm going to skip this. Um, we've been talking about this already. Um, I want to talk about some of the tools that we've done, actually, in terms of really getting the word out. And one thing that we did in 2010 was decided to survey um, payers in New England. So we sent out a survey um, to 45 payers um, with questions about, you know, do they have registries, who do they serve, what does their population look like, um, you know, services that they're willing to cover, the codes that they use. Oh, sorry. Um, their um, types of providers that they pay for. So we got 25 responses. Six of them were Medicaid managed care organizations. You can see this up here. Um, and then we analyzed that um, against the best practices. Um, so, you know, our rationale was that there's best practices out here and are you paying for best practices? Um, and we wanted to see the limitations, and we wanted them to see the limitations of what they were covering and what they weren't covering. And if you want to look at our full report, you can look at it on our website. So I'm just going to cover um, two of our findings because we've been talking a lot about asthma education as well as home visiting programs. And so, as we all know, asthma education in the clinic or in the home is one of the best practices recommended by the NAEPT um, that you know really improves patient outcomes. And what we found was that about a third of payers will reimburse for a separate or extended visit. That means that two-thirds will not. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of complications about in what circumstances that happens in and how do people actually bill for that. Um, in terms of home-based clinical environmental services, um, that's provided by less than half the plans. 
just feel susceptible to be now that we got into our work in terms of program development for our um, CMS grant I'm going to talk about is you know, what people are willing to cover even for home-based services is um, a lot of nuances for that. It's really complicated in terms of what they'll pay for. Um, I think a lot of them would be willing to pay for a visiting nurse visit, um, which doesn't necessarily get to the issue of cultural competency and paying for environmental supplies. Um, so although this is part of our report, I feel like there's a lot of complications in this. Um, anyway, again, we're talking about um, 25 responses here. So what we found, and you're not surprised to see this, is that there's you know a lot of instances where policies don't align with best practices, which is why we're here today. Um, there's a lot of inconsistencies, and a lot of things that we found also that what there was um, a lot of inconsistencies about what kind of providers they're willing to pay for. You know, is it just the doctor? Is it nurse practitioners? The nurse? Who are they willing to pay for? Um, and this is especially in regards to anything having to do with non-clinical practices such as home visiting. Um, so one of the things that we think is really important is, is um, convening. So um, in 2010, we had our second symposium with payers and policymakers. It was really about bringing back our tools to the table to tell them about what we have documented um, to share the gap analysis about what they were or were not doing. Um, we had people from around the country come speak about the shifting healthcare system, which was shifting, still shifting, but really shifting in 2010, um, and opportunities and challenging challenges. Um, we had different people come speak about their model and programs. Um, one of the things that we found was is, you know, there was open dialogue. I think there was around 70 people there, um, and there was policymakers um, as well as payers, and um, our state asthma managers felt like that, you know, coming together across the six New England states was really important in terms of bringing more payers together, but also bringing um, advocates as well as policymakers and providers together from our, each of our states that they were able to develop relationships and have some of the payers join steering committees of uh, a pilot program. So for example, in Rhode Island, they were just kicking off a home visiting program. They were able to get two payers to join them at their table in terms of their steering committee. In Connecticut, they were really able to develop a relationship with their um, Medicaid director and start talking about how do they get coverage for pay for performance for asthma education in the clinic, which is what they were working on. But they felt like they couldn't have done that on their own. So I can't um, de emphasize enough the importance of convening and bringing people together um, in a way to discuss these issues. Um, so this actually, I would say, um, this might be what some people are most curious about, has led to um, our um, application to CMS, the Healthcare Innovation Challenge Award. I'd say one of our outcomes at our um, symposium at the time was people said, well, we should apply, we should try to get pilot funding from CMS. Um, this is back in November 2010. And so we knocked on some doors at CMS at the time, and there were no resources, no opportunities, but we were thinking, how can we do this? And then a year later, this CMS um, Healthcare Innovation Challenge is announced. Um, for those that don't know, they were giving away a billion dollars to implement um, new ideas for improved care, better health, and lower costs for healthcare, better health outcomes. And so we decided to go for it, and go for it we did. It was a lot of work, but we got it, so it's great. Um, so we decided that we were going to put together something called the New England Asthma Innovation Collaborative. Um, our goal was really to create a marketplace. We already have a marketplace in New England, um, but to create a marketplace for um, asthma um, interventions for both asthma education, but really focusing on home visiting programs with the goal of improving the quality of life and success for kids. You can read this, reducing disparities, um, demonstrate saving, focusing on promoting community health workers and a culturally competent workforce um, and creating long-term policy change. And really our goal is to develop capacity as well as um, sustainability in terms of financing. And we have a lot of um, programs in New England or several programs in New England just like here that are grant funded that once the grant runs out, the program goes away and people are always scurrying after funding. So um, I did not put a lot of slides in here about this so I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, so really we're focusing on service delivery expansion, workforce development, 
um, committed Medicaid payers and people learning together. And I just really want to briefly talk about our process in terms of putting this together. Um, is we're working with um, eight, eight healthcare institutions that we're funding that are part of this. Actually, first I'll go to the next slide and talk about this. So we are being funded four million dollars over three years. Our original budget was six point nine million dollars. Our budget's been cut back in the process. Um, we have projected um, four point one million dollars savings to the healthcare system over three years. Um, a lot of that work was done with the um, AHRQ return on investment calculator um, for asthma, um, and based on in information that we had from our partners. Um, and so this projected return on investment of a dollar and fifty-four cents to five dollars and twenty-two cents. The five dollars and twenty-two cents is for return on investment for every dollar is for an asthma education in clinic services provided that Connecticut is working on. Um, so just really briefly, we are working with um, eight healthcare institutions across New England, Children's Hospital is one of them. Um, we have three in Massachusetts, two in Rhode Island, two in Connecticut, and one in rural Vermont. And during our process, we are looking at places that were either already providing services with CMS, it was a quick ramp up of services, but where we were able to also engage payers so we have five Medicaid managed care organizations in Rhode Island, Connecticut, that said that they will participate in this process. Um, they will refer patients. They will share data um, regarding high-risk patients or patients they think need to be served based on a lot of the target activities that you were talking about. We're not doing Zolaire. We're doing ER visits, um, hospitalizations, um, or oral, of course, the oral steroids in the last year, so high-risk patients. Um, and that in, if we can demonstrate by the end of year two that um, that there is a return on investment or for one payer cost effectiveness, they will be willing to reimburse for and they committed to limited numbers um, of patients that they'd be willing to reimburse with for. But with the idea that they would then ramp up services. If they're seeing return on investment, they would just ramp this up and create policy. Um, in Connecticut and Vermont, we're working with their Medicaid offices, um, which are a little more complicated um, because of the state Medicaid office and their systems, but we're hoping to be able to show cost savings and to have them adopt these services. Um, Vermont is actually looking at um, using this as a model to embed this in their new chronic care teams that they have in Vermont that they would then be able to replicate in other parts of Vermont. Um, one of my big learnings through negotiating with payers to get this grant written and meeting more in depth with our payers is the disparities between what payers think this costs and what providers, what it does cost them. Um, so I think that there's a lot of learning to be done over the next couple of years in terms of you know, payers saying we're going to pay $150 for a visit, which might be for a visiting nurse, versus getting payers to pay for a package, a suite of services, um, and to really get payers and providers more in alignment or to a closer place to what it, what it costs and what payers are willing to pay for. So I think there's a lot of work ahead for us with that, um, but we're really excited about the opportunity to work with a lot of great providers who have had HUD grants or other grants to be doing this work um, or paying through their community benefits um, and are ramping up. So, um, I just want some of the acknowledgments. We've been funded for the last couple of years by the Kresge Foundation, um, some of our work with our business cases, the Boston Foundation, Department of Health and Human Services, Region 1. Um, I already mentioned Lori Stillman and Polly Hopkins from UMass Lowell. Um, also Molly Jacobs, and now obviously we've gotten a, a grant from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare um, for our Healthcare Innovation Challenge award, which we're really excited about. Um, actually, in your packages, there's a sheet with um, all of our publications, if you want any of them. We always encourage people to use our publications, and we look forward to sharing more results from our work. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a little quick to the program. Please find your seat. 
We have a, a special guest behind the curtain here. He is waiting patiently. You probably all, of course, recognize him. And he doesn't have this introduction. But this is the Dr. James Krieger. He is the Disease Control Officer for Public Health Seattle and King County, Washington. And he is a nationally recognized expert in housing and health and the development and evaluation of community-based chronic disease control and prevention programs. Um, he, in many ways, and we have these across the country, is our go-to guy for many things that we have to do in the department. And so we are very pleased he can join us via webinar. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Krieger, and this mic will be off and he will be controlling his own presentation. Dr. Krieger. Hey, great, thanks for the introduction. Um, and I'm assuming that it's all working. Um, the technology is great. And it's really nice to be able to join everybody in Cleveland from Seattle. And I appreciate the opening remarks by uh, Deputy Secretary Jones and Dr. Ticano and, and Dora Dearborn and Peter. And um, I was able to catch part of what Susan and Stacy had to say as well. And this is a, a really incredibly exciting and talented bunch of people that I get to um, join today. So thank you very much for the invitation. What I've been asked to do is just do a brief overview of the um, work that we've been done, doing in the Seattle and King County area about um, delivering home visits for asthma and what we've learned over the past 15 years or so as we've developed programs and implemented them. So I'll give you a little bit of a history of that and what we've learned. Although it's not advancing, Let's see what can I do here? Okay, so um, we started off this work about 15 years ago with funding from the National Institute of Environmental Health in our Healthy Homes One project, where we wanted to do two things. One is test the effectiveness of community health workers as part of the team managing asthma and controlling asthma, and particularly looking at their role in doing home visits to address environmental triggers. So Healthy Homes One um, was based on doing in-home environmental assessments, as well as then providing um, tailored interventions to participants in the homes um, through community health workers to reduce exposure to indoor asthma triggers. And what we did is um, a single visit model as a control group compared to the full intervention because it was a community-based participatory research project and we wanted to make sure that everybody received at least some benefit. It was a randomized controlled trial. We enrolled 274 low-income households that contain a child with asthma, and our results were published in 2005. The community health workers in this project, as in all of our subsequent projects, were lay people from the community. They shared culture, language, and life experiences with clients, so they were able to develop an immediate and trusting relationship and rapport with their clients. And they all have personal experience with asthma, either among with themselves or with a child with asthma or a close family member. Um, they serve a key role in sort of bridging the gap between service providers like community clinics and hospitals and health departments and community members. And particularly this we found was important because of sometimes the lack of trust between um, community members and the institutions that are, are trying to serve them. Because they were lay people from the community, they didn't have um, the technical knowledge of how you do a home environmental assessment or work with people with asthma. So they received a rigorous and standardized training to make sure that they were providing accurate information to um, their clients. The research design was um, focusing on low-income kids, as I mentioned, who, um, and children age four to 12. The high-intensity group got a full intervention, which I'll go on to describe, and the low-intensity group got a single um, uh, visit, um, a follow-up phone call to see how they were doing, and um, some, the only resource they got was um, allergy control bedding covers, but it's important to note that they did get this important um, support. And what we found um, as a result of these um, home visits um, was that um, we saw a significant dec um, decrease in the high-intensity group in um, urgent health services, which we defined as hospital visits, um, emergency department visits and unscheduled clinic visits. 
And um, we saw some, but not a significant decline in the comparison group. And the difference of differences between the high intensity group and the low intensity group was statistically significant, meaning that we saw a greater decline in the urgent utilization among um, folks receiving the full, the full bore intervention. When we looked at symptom days, the, so the proportion of days that had symptoms in the preceding two weeks, um, again, we found significant declines in the high intensity group, but also a significant decrease in the low intensity group. Um, and a non-significant difference of differences across the group. So both groups tended to improve over time in terms of having fewer days in the past two weeks with symptoms and large declines going from more than half the days of the week um, to only about three days in the past two weeks. And then we looked at standardized measures of um, quality of life. Um, in this particular case, because they were children, we looked at the caregiver quality of life score developed by Liz Juniper. And we found that while the caregiver quality of life improved, again, in the intervention and comparison group, there was a significantly greater improvement in the um, quality of life of caregivers who were in our full-bore high-intensity intervention. So to summarize what we found in our very first foray, which focused particularly on trigger reduction um, in the home, we found that we saw statistically greater improvements in both the quality of life and in healthcare utilization among the intervention group, while both groups improved um, in the um, symptom day measure. We then moved on to do a second intervention study, again funded by NIEHS, called Healthy Homes 2. And this was based on what we learned in this first intervention and also uh, particularly responded to the participants' interest in having a more holistic approach to helping them manage their child's asthma. So not only addressing home environment indoor issues, but also supporting them in the medical aspects of asthma self-management. So we expanded the work here to um, look at improving self-management skills. And what we um, did was we, wanted, we also wanted to test how good is the home visit compared to what is the usual, quote, standard of care, which is getting asthma education in, um, in the clinic. So everybody in this study got asthma education from a nurse who was trained as a certified asthma educator in the clinic. In addition, half the folks got the in-home visits by community health workers. So this is a pretty high bar to detect impact of a home visit because it shows ad we were testing the hypothesis of whether you get added benefit from a um, home visit in addition to routine asthma education in the clinic. Again, we focused on kids age 3 to 13, low income, who have persistent or poorly controlled asthma. Um, we did a randomized control trial, as we did previously, and we compared outcomes in enrollment to those one year later using community-based participatory research methods. And what we found here is um, first looking at the symptom-free day measure is that, again, while we saw improvements with the nurse, um, increasing from 9.5 to 10.8 symptom-free days, we saw greater improvements among those who also, in addition, received the community health worker visit at home, and this was a statistically significant difference across the groups in symptom-free days. So to um, reiterate, those who got the home visits by the community health workers had more symptom-free days than those who just got nurse visits. When we looked at ur urgent healthcare utilization, we saw that both groups improved. So those who got the nurse-only visits, there was a lower percentage by the end of the intervention of, of kids who had urgent utilization. There was a bigger decline we observed with those who got community health worker um, visits on top of the nurse visits, but the difference was not statistically significant across the two groups. And when we look at improvement in caretaker quality of life, we saw greater improvements in the community health worker group again, um, and those differences did reach statistical significance. So to summarize this study, we saw statistically greater improvements in those who got the community health worker visit um, in quality of life and symptoms, but not in the um, urgent health care utilization. But again, net, net bottom line, adding the community health workers to nurse-based asthma education resulted in, in improvements for, for our children. We looked at some of what might have mediated that improvement, and we saw that those who got the home visits by the community health workers, the, the parents of the kids took more actions to control asthma, whether it was 
cleaning the house better, whether it was getting pets out, whether it was controlling tobacco use, whether it was um, using medications and action plans more appropriately, net, the, um, the parents of the kids who got the community health worker visit were more engaged and took more actions to control asthma, so potentially explaining why we saw better asthma outcomes in this, in this group. And, and I'll end the data piece of this in summarizing our studies with some new data that we are just um, finishing analysis of. So this is preliminary, where we extended the work to adults with asthma. And this, to my knowledge, is the first study that has actually looked at home visits for adults with asthma, um, whereas we have a pretty good evidence base at this point of the benefit of home visits for kids with asthma. This, again, was funded by NIEHS, and it was a randomized controlled trial with 300 66 participants age 8 to 65 who had not well-controlled asthma or worse by the NAAPP criteria and were low income. And we did relatively similar intervention than as what we applied already to kids. There was an intake visit and four follow-up visits by a community health worker. We provided support and self-management, such as knowing to identify when asthma symptoms get worse, how to use an action plan, how to use your medications properly. And then we also did the home environmental assessment, and we provided um, various supplies to help manage exposure to the um, asthma triggers in the home. And we emphasized coordination with primary care. So after each visit to the home, the primary care provider got a, a written report of um, the status of asthma control and what was happening in the home in terms of the work that the community health worker was doing. And again, in our preliminary analysis, and this will probably change as we dive into the data a little more detail, we found a significant improvement in symptom-free days, so those who got the home visits compared to an intervention group which received usual care, of about 2.1 more um, symptom-free days per two weeks, and this was statistically significant. Quality of life improved greater by 0.5 units, which is a clinically significant improvement in the intervention group that got the home visits compared to usual care. We did not detect a difference um, in urgent care utilization and we detected a statistically significant improvement in the asthma control questionnaire score, which is a standard measure for how well asthma is controlled. When we looked to see what improved more in the intervention group compared to the comparison group, um, we found that they used their medications better in terms of both technique and in terms of, of adherence, that they improved dust control in their homes better. They ended up with fewer pets in their homes at the end of the intervention, and they were more likely to be using asthma plans to help self-monitor and, and manage their asthma themselves. So these all tended to show people did better in the group that got the home visits compared to a usual care group. And again, the important thing is this now seems to work for adults as well as for children, and that's a new finding. So over the course of the year, we've now visited, actually we're up to more than 1,400 homes um, over the last decade to deliver these kind of services all across King County, but particularly in low-income areas, which are most likely to have substandard housing and, and more problems with asthma control. And what we've concluded from this, this, this um, involvement with doing home visits is that home visits by community health workers that can address indoor trigger exposure and self-management support clearly improve asthma outcomes, even when they're added to um, more traditional clinic-based asthma support activities. In adults, up to 21 more symptom-free days per year, or rather in children, excuse me, and in adults, up to 55 more symptom-free. So big benefits from the quality of life perspective um, for, and symptom perspective for, for the people suffering from asthma, and also more modest improvements in quality of life for the children's caretakers and for the children or adults' um, urgent care utilization. So um, because we targeted our work on kids who were affected by asthma disparities in this intervention work, it's a promising strategy, we think, for reducing the persistent asthma disparities that we observe. Um, we also recognize, though, that home visits is not one size fits all. So home visits might be more effective and more appealing to certain families or adults with asthma, but others still might prefer to have group activities or one-on-one -on -one based clinic education. And we know from other studies that those modalities of providing asthma self-management support are also effective, so it, it might be appropriate to offer and provide in a community a range of types of asthma self-management supports and then provide an individual or a family with what they view as most helpful to them or they're most likely to participate in. 
what we've learned is key elements of home visit programs over the years, and I think this is pretty consistent with my understanding of what other programs around the country have been finding. It's important that the home visitor, whether it's a CHW or some other kind of health professional, have a reasonable caseload. We found that about 50 to 60 clients at a time is reasonable. That it's best to focus these interventions on clients with poorly controlled asthma. So probably in terms of focusing resources, not on people who have mild asthma that's relatively well controlled. You get more bang for your buck if you focus on those with the more poorly controlled asthma. That um, although programs when we started out a decade ago tended to be pretty intensive with 10 visits or more even, um, we're finding that we can get pretty equivalent results with an initial visit and then maybe three even or at the most four follow-up visits and then with a few clients adding extra visits as needed um, if they need more help. But to really kind of make this program more efficient, we can probably get way with this number of visits. The content needs to cover a range of activities including the medical self-management skills, how to take your meds, how to use an action plan, knowing when to contact your provider, as well as focusing on identifying and reducing triggers in the home. It's important also to help our clients effectively communicate with their medical providers so that they can make sure they bring their issues to a visit, but they also understand what the provider is telling them. And finally, coordination between the home visitor and the medical home is important. Um, we think that an approach that's client-centered that uses techniques such as motivational interviewing to meet clients with where they're at, ask what their changes they're ready to make, what issues are most important to them, and start with those as opposed to rigidly adhering to a step-by-step -step kind of protocol is effective. It's important to address the psychosocial needs and resource barriers. Many of these are very stressed, low-income families. They have issues with employment, with um, transportation, with domestic violence, with lack of food in the home, et cetera. And so really being able to help with those issues as well as doing the asthma work is critical to engaging and working with the, provide, with the clients over time and providing them then social support. The community health workers have become real parts of the support system and support network of our clients. And that's been helpful in, in engaging them in motivating change. We found that providing supplies to low-income families are important. You can't just tell them to reduce dust in your home and put bedding and casements on your home if they don't have money to pay for it. So we provide them as, with a core of a, of a HEPA-level vacuum of bedding and casements, a cleaning kit, and then for a subset of folks exposed to tobacco smoke or pets, for example, where HEPA air filters have been shown to efficacy, we provide those as well. We've also found it's really important to have a tracking client system that tracks clients and periodically we check in with them then and follow up so we make sure we don't lose them to follow up. And then it's important to have a basic infrastructure to support the community health workers in doing their work through training and continuing education, through good supervision, um, both from a, a management perspective uh, as well as a clinical backup system so they have supervision clinically by a certified asthma educator. Um, we find it's important to review the quality of the home visits both by reviewing charts and by going out on home visits to observe the community health workers so we know we're doing what we think we're doing, and then having a data system that's set up to track all this stuff that we can then we can review over time. In terms of cost, we're finding it's costing us now about $700 to $900 per household to deliver the full intervention, which, as, as Dora already mentioned previously, is a bargain compared to what some of the costs of, of, of asthma medications are or a bargain to what one ED visit costs. In terms of recruiting our, our participants, we've been working pretty closely now with managed care organizations as well as with clinics um, to identify members with poorly controlled asthma and they're using utilization data or um, medication administrative data who's getting lots of beta agonist refills, for example, um, to identify initially potential participants. The plan then is inviting the members to participate in our programs and then we'll contact and follow up to do a more detailed intake to see indeed if they have poorly controlled or not well-controlled asthma and then enroll them. Um, we, as I mentioned, are really doing an emphasis on coordinating care with medical homes. So the visit encounters are shared by um, fax or email and often if there's an electronic health record then entered into the electronic health record by the uh, clinic. Um, we also provide access with directly with the provider if there's something more urgent by phone or fax or email. If some, a kid, for example, is, is very poorly controlled and might need a medication adjustment. 
Um, we're, we are seeking now to work with our plans to develop a reimbursement mechanism that would be a per member served, i.e. a fixed charge for enrollment in the program. And whether the child or the adult ends up needing three visits or five visits or even six visits in some case, it would be a fixed fee that we would charge for, that we would um, be reimbursed for by the plan. And we also then um, are wanting to continue to track how well things are doing so we can, we, we can report back to both providers and the plans um, how, we're, how well we're doing. So the plans are tracking utilization costs and medication prescriptions, and we're helping analyze those data. And our, in the home, we're tracking symptoms and other asthma control measures, and then we're able to put those together into a composite report on how the program is helping plan members um, manage their asthma and their asthma costs. So that's kind of where we're at right now, and you know, I look forward as we have our panel discussion coming up to answer any further questions um, and engage in dialogue with um, the other folks who are here at this conference to talk about the nuts and bolts of how this program might work and be applicable in, in Cleveland. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Krieger. Thanks for hanging out the rest of the afternoon as well. Our next speaker is uh, Stu Greenberg, who uh, he's a modest gentleman, but he is known as the uh, godfather of healthy homes. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I am told that, so I need to make sure I say that. Uh, Mr. Greenberg recently retired as Executive Director of Environmental Health Watch, and since 1980 has helped public and policymakers address critical health concerns related to urban and industrial environment in Northeast Ohio. So really under his leadership, um, this pioneering of a healthy home, healthy house strategy starting in 1985 with the blueprint for a healthy house conferences, uh, the first national meetings to bring together health and housing agencies and advocates. And since 19, or in 1991, Environmental Health Watch published the Healthy House Catalog, the first national directory of healthy house resources. It's a pleasure to introduce, welcome Mr. Stu Greenberg. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> good. Okay, well, thanks, Matt. Um, I decided I'm not thanking anybody else, and I'm not doing any more acknowledgement in interest of trying to get us back on track. Uh, Dor uh, gave an overview of the Safe Healthy Homes and Patients Program, which is a HUD funded, uh, just completed last uh, December. HUD funded. Uh, uh, healthy House Demonstration Grant. So what I'm going to uh, uh, sort of a on the preliminary outcomes. I'm going to focus on what we actually do at home to give you an idea of what it is we're asking payers to pay for. Uh, Somewhat uh, greater specificity. Okay, thanks a lot. So here are the um, uh, key partners and, and funders for the project. Uh, I'll just say a word about Environmental Health Watch. Our mission is uh, healthy. What? It's uh, healthy homes, healthy communities, and healthy clients. Um, okay, thank you. So um, the the purpose of the Case Healthy Homes and Patients program was was twofold initially. Uh, first was uh, to provide physicians in training with the experience of a home visit to learn about housing related health hazards and then also to provide assistance to those families in identifying and reducing health hazards. And then uh, we added a small component to test the feasibility of, of working directly with uh, the pediatric pulmonology uh, division at Rainbow, uh, Rain Rainbow Hospital to, to uh, see about the uh, uh, feasibility of responding to children recently hospitalized and uh, providing the continuity between the uh, inpatient care and the inpatient, particularly the uh, asthma education provided inpatient 
and, and the home visit. So um, these are the components of the, I mean, these are the steps of the asthma component of the CHAP program. So all the referrals for this, pro for this uh, project were from uh, pediatric pulmonology. In and then the patients were interviewed by a uh, sweat wound center nurse. And then um, the fellow and uh, an EHW uh, inspector went to the home for a home visit. Uh, just about every fellow went out at least once. They have very challenging uh, schedules, so uh, they, they certainly didn't come out on each visit. And just to be clear, uh, we're not recommending that physician home visits be part of a sort of a standard of uh, uh, care for treatment for uh, asthma home visits. But in this case, it was part of a physician's in, in training. Uh, then uh, after that initial visit, EHW staff uh, would do follow-up visits, one to four visits, uh, and conduct low to moderate level interventions and then make referrals for uh, you know, what would be classified as, as major interventions. And then the expectation was that when the patients were followed up, whatever behavioral uh, changes uh, were recommended, that those would be reinforced by their physician in, in the clinic setting. These are our uh, two terrific uh, home visit uh, staff. Uh, uh, Akbar Tyler is a healthy home specialist as well as a uh, pest con certified pest control uh, contractor. So that would, that you'll see that's, that's key to uh, much of what we did. And then Kim is a uh, uh, certified asthma educator. We um, identified these five uh, management tasks for families that are, that are dealing with asthma. And our focus, of course, has been on, on uh, trigger control uh, control of triggers in the home, but there's a lot of incidental asthma education that occurs that deals with uh, managing the medication regimen, which is often very complicated, difficult for people to understand, and if you have, which is not uncommon, two or three kids with asthma, it's a real uh, challenge for uh, families to manage. Then uh, the uh, dealing with uh, exacerbations, follow-up visits, how to, how to use the healthcare system. And then dealing with schools is also a key piece that's often left out, um, making sure that schools have uh, the asthma control plan. Uh, I don't know if people, uh, if this is a, a drawing that's widely used. This was a, a young uh, child with asthma asked to draw a picture of how it felt to have, uh, to have an asthma attack. Um, this, I think, is an absolutely terrific flowchart. Many of you have probably seen it before, which really tells the whole story of the asthma home visit strategy. And it, it shows the two targets for the home intervention, occupant behavior, uh, and then building uh, physical changes to the building. And I think we're not going to study it now, but I really think it's, it's worth it to, to, to follow, follow through the the flow because I think it it provides the rationale for the whole uh, asthma home visit uh, process. Um, these are the uh, inhalant allergens and respiratory irritants that are the asthma triggers that are the the target for our interventions and they come from the the expert panel report. Um, we think that it's particularly uh, important to be able to target interventions based on actual exposure and patient sensitivity when, when that uh, skin testing data is available. It's uh, more effective, less costly, and particularly it's less of a burden on the family to tell them uh, to do specific things, and work with them to do specific things rather than saying there are all these things that, are, that could be asthma triggers and this is what you have to try and deal with. Uh, the photo shows, uh, as part of our assessment process, if we saw a house like that, we would know there's a high level of roach infestation. That, that's what that tells you. So the um, assessment process starts with uh, in the home with, a, with an occupant interview, 
uh, talking about uh, uh, the uh, asthma history, but also the uh, what's going on in the house. Has there been flooding? Are there heating problems? Those kinds of things. And then a pretty thorough interior and exterior uh, walkthrough by the EHW staff with family members and uh, the physician, if they're uh, if they're along as well. And this is really the key opportunity for. Uh, uh, family education uh, about, about the site-specific uh, home triggers that are identified and that it, when they're identified then there's a discussion of how they can be controlled. Is it something the family can do? Is it something EHW can help with? Is it something that requires a, a higher level of intervention? So these are the kinds of things that we're looking for in these, in these uh, walkthroughs. Uh, the first points are focusedly, uh, focused particularly on trigger sources, but also this is a healthy house project, so we look, look at lots of other things. We measure the tap water, we measure the temperature in the refrigerator, we look for uh, trip and fall hazards, and uh, that kind of thing. So um, this uh, program is a HUD-funded healthy house program, so it's, the interventions are based on the healthy house approach of addressing multiple hazards, most of them from interacting uh, uh, housing failures, and, and the evidence is, and the experience certainly over the last 20 years is, that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, currently, there are two uh, HUD-funded uh, healthy house projects in Cleveland, both of which uh, address asthma triggers, and both of which do that through integration with weatherization work in the home. And one is the City County Healthy House Initiative, which is led by the Cuyahoga County Board of Health, uh, now in its eighth year, I think, of this project. And then the uh, new Warm and Healthy Homes for Cleveland project, which is uh, being done by EHW with the uh, Cleveland Department of Community Development, but with all, which also preserves the uh, physician education through home visits aspect of, of DOOR's original program. So um, there are really three potential actors in terms of interventions. There are things a family can do, things that EHW can do, and then things that the physician can do. So as I say, the family education is very site-specific. It's geared to the walkthrough. And um, what, what we find is that uh, People, particularly where the child has been hospitalized, really know a lot about asthma. They have a lot of information. But what they need is assistance in problem solving. How do you deal with the particular problems that are found in their home? So things like smoking. You know, everybody knows you're not supposed to smoke inside, uh, but how do you negotiate that with other uh, household members? How do you uh, talk to uh, visitors about it? So there are a lot of site-specific things, uh, both in terms of behavior and in terms of uh, 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 building uh, elements that, that uh, we try and form sort of a, a therapeutic alliance with the families to do problem solving. How can we figure this out? Um, we do, uh, we give uh, health and safety items and I'll, or that, that have been talked about in the other programs. I'll talk about I'll list some of those in a minute. We do some low-level direct intervention, so that might be pest control, it might be uh, uh, certain repairs, plumbing repairs, that kind of thing. And then we also refer for higher-level uh, repairs. And then with the family, we again negotiate. What are the things, what are the behavior changes that you can make to help control these triggers? And then we ask the physician to reinforce those kinds of things in uh, when they see the patients again in home visits. And then Dor uh, alluded to this uh, expert panel and this from uh, the CDC and National Center for Healthy Housing. And these are sort of the basis of our uh, evidence-based intervention. So I'm going to quickly step through, I think, seven or eight specific kinds of interventions that we do in the home. Many of the projects of this kind 
give people uh, vacuum cleaners. We've probably given away a couple thousand vacuum cleaners over the years. They're helpful in reducing uh, uh, allergen and irritant load in, uh, you know, that builds up in settled dust. They're also very uh, effective in reducing uh, lead loading on uh, surfaces. So they're, uh, and people love them. They really, it's, it's, uh, it's a great door opener. Uh, so uh, it helps uh, helps us get it get it in the door. And then again, as in many programs, we provide uh, mattress and pillow covers. But one of the things we try and do with all these things is it, it, uh, rather than just handing them to people, we try and uh, where possible help them put on the, the bedding covers and, and the mattress covers because. Uh, if you don't do that, what we find is you come back on another visit, they're still sitting there in the plastic. And so part of the, part of the home visit process is engaging the families in, in uh, taking action. Uh, somebody said roaches are a big problem in Cleveland. That's true. Uh, and, but mice are also. So uh, it turns out roaches, cockroaches, German cockroaches, are a very potent asthma trigger. And they're quite pervasive in Cleveland, so this is a big focus of of, uh, of our and we see it in a lot of the houses that we visit. So uh, part of the uh, division of labor is for the family to understand their role in environmental controls, denying roaches, hiding places, food, water, that kind of thing. And then we use integrated pest management (ITM). Uh, which is a, an approach that uses uh, the least toxic, uh, or least volatile pesticides in, in uh, very tiny amounts. And the technique that we find very helpful is to flush the roaches with a hot air gun. Uh, you run the hot air gun, for example, along the baseboards where the roaches often hide. Uh, the roaches run out. We have somebody with a backpack. Uh, HEPA vacuum, they're vacuuming up the roaches, and uh, the live roaches, the dead roaches, the dead parts, the roach dust, so they're immediately removing a lot of live roaches and a lot of allergenic material. And then third, that process identifies where the roaches are actually hiding, so that's where we provide the bait. We think this is particularly important for families that have had an essentially intractable roach problem for a long time. So they're, and people have been telling them, you know, all kinds, the landlord or whoever has been telling them, well, if you just clean up, you know, you won't have roaches, you have to do this or that. So it, we think it's particularly effective for them to see that a lot of roaches are being taken care of. It's sort of a, a step toward uh, making, making the uh, uh, problem something that can actually be, uh, be uh, attacked. In, a, in an effective way. Uh, uh, so we do a lot of the direct ro uh, roach control, but sometimes if it's a terrible infestation, uh, we bring in a, um, a contractor, and that uh, that cost can can vary considerably. Um, all these uh, allergen and irritant sources built up build up in settled dust and in, in reservoirs like uh, uh, carpeting. Uh, and so cleaning and decontamination, decluttering are all, uh, can be very important for certain families. And uh, this is a negotiation about who does what, and it's a, an assessment of what are the capabilities within the family. So sometimes the family says, okay, now I get it. This is what I, this is what we need to do. Uh, sometimes we need to provide hands-on hands assistance. We provide bins for storage. A lot of the homes that we go into have very little uh, furniture, so just places to physically store things and get them off the floor uh, is something can, that can be very helpful. And in some cases, uh, we provide for professional uh, carpet cleaning because the carpet has become uh, such a uh, uh, source. Uh, so they're a sink and a source. When a carpet isn't too dirty, it becomes a sink. It sort of captures the particulates, and then if you can vacuum them up, then that's great. When they're so uh, saturated with contaminants, then every time you walk on them, you're, you're stirring it up, so they, they, they become a source themselves. Uh, we find a, a lot of houses where people use uh, 
stoves for space heating because their heating system is not uh, adequate. Uh, uh, and in some cases, we find unvented fuel uh, burning uh, heaters, both of which are problems for uh, gas exposure. So um, what we've done in, in several cases is we give people electric space heaters uh, to deal with the, the, the room heating. And uh, we provide uh, furnace filters. And um, what, what, what families often, one way they respond when you tell them all these hundreds of things that they need to do to fix up their home is that it, they just despair of how can I, you know, it's overwhelming. So one way to make it more manageable is to focus on the bedroom as a safe place, as a place where at least for a few hours or several hours, uh, the person with asthma is sort of free from those assaults. It's also important where you have a situation where you're not really going to be able to control the source of some of these hazards. That might be pets, it might be smoking, it might be other things. So at least you can try and create an asylum uh, area where those things can be more manageably controlled. And particularly where the, the Allergens or irritants are those that tend to remain airborne, like from tobacco smoke or from pets. A uh, HEPA air cleaner can be effective. But again, there are a whole set of things you have to do. You have to keep the door closed. You have to take shoes off. You have to remove dust catchers and that kind of thing from, from the home. I mean, from the bedroom. Um, and then, as we're going through the house and identifying uh, hazards, we're talking to people about things they can do uh, on an ongoing basis to uh, reduce uh, the exposure uh, for their kids. And so it's pest control, pet control, uh, smoking, of course. Uh, one big thing is the use of household cleaners and, and so-called air freshers. We find a lot of this use. And sometimes it's so sad, we find families that use a lot of air cleaners, so-called air cleaners, air freshers, because they think it's cleaning the air for their kids. So uh, we also see a lot of uh, uh, smoke, uh, no, what do you call it, candles, uh, scented candles. So talk, that, talking to people about that is something that turns out to be important, and there are all these other kinds of, of specific uh, things uh, to help people figure out. So um, the, the equipment costs, the, the various things we can provide might vary from three to five, six hundred dollars. Uh, the contract work, if we have to do additional uh, pest control or carpet cleaning or some other kind of uh, uh, work, uh, that might that can be from 150 to a thousand dollars. Our staffing costs for the visits, uh, depending on the number of visits, of course, of course, are going to be four to eight hundred dollars. So the total cost is going to be someplace. I mean, our total cost is someplace in the neighborhood of uh, seven hundred to twenty-five hundred dollars. And we're now exploring talking to the door and and uh, about. Uh, a business plan for Environmental Health Watch to see if there's a, a fee basis uh, for providing this, not just through funded programs, but as as a as a service. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to ask. I don't think we have a presentation for the panel. Are panel members to please come up? Don't tell me you don't know who you are. I just want to make that clear. Our moderator is uh, J.B. Silvers, who is uh, the John R. Mannix Medical Mutual of Ohio Professor of Healthcare Management and Professor of Banking and Finance at, Finance at the Weatherhead School of Management. He holds a joint appointment in the... Oh, sorry. Uh, has a joint appointment in the School of Medicine, uh, all at Case Western. He's also the interim dean at the Weatherhead School of Management. And uh, as a uh, logistics, all the mics are on all the time, so don't grunt them. And uh, if you need somebody to repeat, you may have to repeat any of the questions from the audience.
Thank you very much. Well, we only have um, we have about two hours to wrap this session up, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do this, but we're going to tackle some things for you. Hopefully, uh, a little priority here. Uh, what I thought we might do is just uh, I might initiate some questions with people that haven't had air time, and then go from there for about 15 minutes, and then leave a little bit of wrap up afterwards. So let me just start off with a uh, question for um, for, uh, for Terry. Uh, Terry, we've, we've been working at Chicago County for quite a long time. Why haven't we solved the problem? And more importantly, what do we do next? Where do we go after this? Well, uh, yeah, I think we've had. Um, We've had a lot of experience with remediation. We have a very strong link to the medical community here. One of the things that uh, comes to mind is certainly looking at the experience of Boston, New England, is there's a, a, a challenge um, as we go forward in dealing with payers. They've got a great model, fantastic work happening in your neck of the woods that I think that your innovation grant may have national implications based on the work we're hoping to do. And so I think that from where we sit, um, there may be an opportunity now to think from HUD's perspective to incentivize the, um, the grants, the, the uh, production grants that happen through Healthy Homes to incentivize connections with community development uh, to try to look at the best use of funds to, to reduce the overall cost for, for home interventions because there's a lot of uh, supplies being provided in some cases, lots of education. But when we start to deal with major moisture problems, which we have a lot of experience with, the cost starts to go up. John, and just talking to John, we're looking at average cost with staff of something like 3,500 bucks ballpark. Is that close? Right, so in the ballpark in terms of actual cost. But then we're talking about longer sustained benefits of the home dealing with moisture infiltration, for instance, and removal, structural removal of materials that may have mold problems. So we have some of those pieces, but it's a question of proof of principle related to cost. But I think HUD could incentivize that process uh, nationally by encouraging people to work with providers, uh, clinical providers, um, encouraging relationships with payers uh, to, to track um, uh, outcomes, and also in support of what we're doing around quality and requirements around quality with the Affordable Care Act. I think solving the problem nationally, it hasn't been done yet. I think that uh, we have great promise because of the Incredible and medical capacity in this community, but I think that there may be opportunities to to, uh, to test here, not just the interventions we we've, we've heard about today, but um, some perhaps more uh, long-lasting interventions in terms of home uh, interventions based on the experience that we have here, as, as Matt mentioned, about eight years of experience um, at really working with folks like Stu and others at Jim Larue over the years that developing a menu of services and driving down costs and acquainting the, the, um, the uh, community development uh, folks who have used to want to spend three or forty thousand dollars to waterproof a house and top to bottom and, and look at a lower cost um, way to address the problem that might be uh, doable in terms of funding you know in a more sustainable way so, so it all goes back to economics, that is what you're telling me, as well as knowledge. But it also takes data, which I want to ask uh, David about. David's the data guy around here. What do we know? How can we use the data more effectively to inform this whole debate? I think, okay. I mean, I think where I come at this is sort of the electronic health record world. And I think, you know, one of the things to leverage in this type of conversation is we're getting more and more data in healthcare settings and all starting to be able to integrate that more and more with other data sources, payer data sources, pharmaceutical company or, or um, you know, pharmacy data sources. And so I think, you know, the, the paradigm I live in is sort of this pair, is this the uh, um, pyramid that talks about data to information to knowledge and wisdom. And I think we're, we're getting to the point for asthma and lots of other healthcare issues where we're starting to have a, have a ton of data, but how do we really get the information, knowledge, and wisdom out of that. Um, I think, you know, another, just one or two more comments. You so know, how do you do it? What's the answer? Well, I think how do we, we've got to come up with some standards. We've got to be willing to share data, and I think that's a, that's a big issue where a lot of people still, um, it's a little bit about the technology, but it's also about sort of the, the, the will to want to share data. I think we have to get the tools to be able to allow people to access the data very easily. I think in, again, the world I live in, we're starting to, to tackle those things. 
where um, you know, not only is the data there, but it's getting easier and easier to access it. People are more and more willing to share data, although people are also learning more that there's, there's data is really a commodity, and so they also see worth in data, and so trying to leverage that. Well, let me just interrupt and push you a little sure. bit. Can we use the Explorers data that you did in this recent study to do something of this sort? Sure, right. Asthma. So, I mean, I've, I've published some that in asthma, but in other things, and there are tools like Explorers, which I presented in a meeting um, earlier this month, where we're already able to aggregate data from now this is 14 million patients all around the country, both children and adults. And, um, you know, actually, the, we had a question after that meeting where I was asked, um, what's the admission rate for asthmatics um, in the metro health system? And then overall, and literally within, I think it was about two minutes, I was able to respond to that question. Um, but again, that would have been, if you would have asked me that question a year ago, I could have only done it for Metro and it would have taken me about six weeks to get you the information because the tool wasn't wasn't available. But so that, that's just one example where, again, for some of these types of questions, the, the tool, the data is already there. Now the tools are getting there. In that model, all of the, the people have been willing to share. Um, so I think there's a lot of pieces, but I guess I'm starting to see that it's really the digital transformation is coming to healthcare, and so then how can we use that to really improve health? I think the other quick angle on this is through things like personal health records or having healthcare systems text patients or do other sort of creative things with technology. Can we leverage some of those technology tools to better sort of, you know, I think the healthcare institution is sort of an island. We, we got to get physicians and others sort of out into the home, and so there's the physical home visit, but there are also, I think, ways to do that virtually, which I don't, I don't know if they'll be as effective or not, but um, I think if, if we think about healthcare only happening in a healthcare setting, we're missing 99.9% you know, .9 of the opportunity. So we've got some additional um, economics with what Terry mentioned, but also the Accountable Care Act, which we don't have time to get into. We're going to have some really, well, we could do that for two hours and plus. <laughs> Uh, we've got some we've got some really interesting data issues. I just want to ask uh, Sheila if there's some more regulatory things from the EPA's point of view or other regulatory bodies that we we might want to address. Greetings, everyone. Speaking of regulatory, um, our program, the um, asthma program out of EPA, is non-regulatory. Our entire indoor air quality program is non-regulatory, so we ask people to take voluntary actions. We don't have the big stick. Um, on the regulatory side. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I know the that, answer, don't bother. Oh, okay. right. That is a question that we need to go way back to talk about. <laughs> well, is there anything from the, from the EPA point of view? I'm sorry, I, I cast you a little bit narrowly. <laughs> oh, that's uh, fine. Um, I, just, I, ha I have some points here, but because of time, I just want to hone in on one particular point. And that is to ask everyone to write down this website, um, asthmacommunitynetwork.org. This is an online tool that we have created. Um, it mm -hmm. is, provides peer-to-peer -peer resources that's dedicated, dedicated to getting communities into action to deliver comprehensive um, asthma care. There are a lot of things happening on that site. And one of the things that surfaces for me or resonates for me from this great meeting today is that we've been talking a lot in our program about how to get interventions reimbursed. And we have helped a lot of um, programs to develop their value proposition, which then they can use to make their business case to potential funders for intervention reimbursement. And you can find a lot of information on the site that I just gave you as the community network. We have a, a, a value proposition worksheet. We have value proposition examples. And so we have success stories, and our goal is to be a place to mobilize those success stories and those best practices and spread them all across the world. Great. So that's just the one thing I want to leave with you to see your time. Well, that's terrific. Now, did everybody get that address? AskCommunityNetwork.org. Oh, great. Or right, you started to say something, Medgar. I didn't let you I do it. I was going to say an adage that I had heard recently. I think it was about uh, God knows the answer. Everybody else provides data. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the answer was we're all winged it other than uh, I'm supposed to leave enough time for some wrap up, so let me just ask the other panelists if there's any reaction that you've got to any of the comments we've had or any follow up since you didn't have a chance to react to each other in two minutes or less. 
<laughs> no, seriously, if there's any, any comments from any of you? Um, well, I had an interesting conversation over um, the break with um, this gentleman here from one of the uh, payer groups. And, um, you know, it's really just that this return on investment, the cost analysis, we really have to go a lot deeper, um, you know, having uh, hopefully with the CMS um, innovation grant, we'll be really able to do um, some more, you know, with, you know, our Medicaid providers, a, a more in-depth uh, cost analysis and really bringing things to scale so that we can, um, you know, make things as efficient as possible. possible. I would have a question sure. about whether or not, from, from the clinical perspective in work today, is there a, a place in the way that CDC has community guide for evidence-based interventions, is there such a place where the range of interventions that involve nurses to community health workers or whether maybe physician-related intervention tied with a home visit or more extensive environmental interventions and return on investment data? There's lots of people, you've heard a number, Jim Krieger and folks here and others that are working at it place where one could go to sort of track the progression uh, of the work to date. Paul Zarbi, do you have a comment there? I think it's directed to you. No. <laughs> well, that's your next job then. Is to go <laughs> hang out. So peer review data as your threshold. Um, we Dave, have. you want to comment because we did have the expert panel that you were involved with at CDC addressing that issue. I think I need to wrap up, so let me just comment. No, this is, and I assume we can tend to hang around here and talk to each other, but this is, um, I, in one of my previous lives, I was CEO of an insurance plan that had about 30,000 uh, rollies in it, medicated rollies, and um, we got as far on, the, and this is a big issue, a really big issue, this popped right to the top. We got as far as putting a nurse in the ER. That was it. Very effective but it didn't deal with all this stuff. And if we had more of this kind of data, I think I would have been more comfortable in saying, let's spend more resources on doing more. But that being said, the next question from a business school point of view, the business case is the action for whom and targeted toward whom, uh, towards whom. Jim had mentioned that individualized care for individual needs was appropriate. That raises to me the same question of, of, that everybody in the business has is, how do I get the right product to the right person at the right time? And, and that's a big issue. We, it takes more than general cost-effectiveness ratio. It takes more than general payoff. It's payoff to whom, to which payers, to which targeted population, how to identify that targeted population, how to intervene for that population in, in whatever level we need. So I think, I think this is a great beginning. It just needs to go farther to really create the business case that will take the day and move it to the next stage where people really make major investments and they can change here. So that's, that's sort of my business school view of this whole thing. I think this is a great session. I enjoy it. I really apologize for cutting off the discussion further because there's some obviously many more things that we could do. But with that, let me end the panel and turn it back to our host so we can wrap up reasonably close on time. Thank you very much. The good thing is those are my closing statements that I was going to make. <laughs> so we just saved five minutes. That's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, our next, we have it up. John, you have a, or Adam, do you have a presentation? No, no, okay. 
Facebook Europe. So uh, joining us for our last presentation is Adam Anderson, the, uh, the uh, Home Choice Housing Coordinator, uh, Ohio Medicaid. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, you know, we uh, we try to be as efficient as we can as possible in the state, which includes uh, minimizing presentations. So I will be brief. Um, I I, I want to say first off, um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here. Um, in in some of the um, in, in some of the rosters, you'll see um, I have letters by my name, and it's a privilege to be in a group of folks that are very well distinguished and very thoughtful. I typically say to folks that I was under the impression that if I bought three graduate degrees, I'd get a fourth one free. Um, so Case, if you're interested in, in giving me that, I think that's great. Um, but it looks like a couple of you were also under that impression as well. So wonderful to be here uh, all the way from Columbus. I want to keep this very brief again. Um, I'm really excited, and some of my words are going to channel uh, the Deputy Secretaries from this morning. And it's that I am incredibly excited as the housing coordinator for the Home Choice Program to see uh, individuals from both the housing world and uh, the uh, kind of medical world working together. In my position, oftentimes uh, we ha I have to speak uh, two different languages, the language of Medicaid and the language of affordable housing. And so to see these folks together in this room to be able to come around a very important subject um, is of critical import. Um, I think that uh, the administration is incredibly interested in this kind of collaboration and encouraging the sharing of ideas. Uh, this creates a more efficient and effective form of government. And things like this draw together uh, local, state, and federal stakeholders, which you see here today. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my program. My program is the Home Choice Program. It came out of the Money Follows the Person demonstration, demonstration grant. It started in 2005 as part of the Deficit Reduction Act and was um, reallocated funding through the Affordable Care Act through 2016. And our role is to help individuals that are in institutional settings uh, to transition into community. Um, in our program, we have served in some capacity over 5,000 individuals. We fully transitioned over 2,200 individuals and including 400, uh, over 400 youth. Um, what's unique about our program and why uh, I think this conversation has been really helpful for me is that every single person that we work with has to be on Medicaid. Um, so many of the individuals that we saw at the beginning uh, would be inclusive of some of the individuals that I work with. So this is certainly something that uh, the population that we work with, but also Medicaid as a whole, uh, finds very interesting. So my specific role as a housing coordinator is on the micro level to help individuals find housing. Um, in Columbus, sometimes it gets difficult to help people in Toledo or to help people in Dayton, but I do the best I can. Uh, more on the mezzo and macro level, it's the forward good affordable housing policy for the state of Ohio. Um, I really am the only uh, housing person who's specifically my job at John Family Services. The reality that Medicaid cannot pay for rent uh, specifically makes it a, a an interesting position really predicated on partnership. And, um, you know, good policy, I think, is built around good partnerships. Um, and so what I hope to do in setting this policy is to try to find ways to um, ensure that we have um, good, affordable, and accessible housing that allows individuals to fully enjoy um, the use of that housing. And I think that that requires a healthy housing, uh, housing that is not just functional, uh, that the roof is not dripping or the windows are not uh, drafty, but in fact um, allows the individuals who live there uh, to enjoy help, healthy and happy lives. Um, many state agencies are taking a critical view of uh, how to continue to move forward good long-term uh, policies. And um, this includes the Office of Health Transformation. I'm sure many of you who are in this state are very familiar uh, with the work that Director Greg Moody is doing and all of us that in some way are working together. I, I sit on the uh, OHP housing work group. Again, we're taking a, a really serious look at uh, how we can uh, continue to, again, advocate for good housing policy for the individuals we serve. Um, we also have groups like the Interagency Council on Homelessness and Affordable Housing. This is a group that brings together multiple state agencies from all across um, the service and uh, the housing arenas including the Department of Development, the Ohio Housing Finance Agency, and others, 
continue to find ways to serve those who are underhoused. Uh, we want to, in the long run, as always, help people find a healthy and happy place to call home. So again, uh, getting you out in relatively brief time, uh, thank you again uh, on behalf of the state and really on behalf of my program uh, to see these kind of partnerships. Um, we're always excited and looking forward to new ways to partner and uh, help Ohioans and especially our youth. So thank you so much. I uh, hope you have wonderful drives home. 71 is one of the most exciting drives I'm sure you all know. So glad I had an extra cup of coffee to keep myself awake. Thank you so much. The, the final word from Dr. Dearborn, Dr. Dear, Dor Dearborn. I just wanted to briefly say we need to have a next step from this meeting. We've, we've heard the issue. We've heard the experience. We've heard the breadth of what can be done. We have some sense of what both the decreased morbidity and what the cost effectiveness can be. And so I think it needs to move to a practical level. All of the payers on that list are going to get an email from me with a doodle approach, and we're going to regather with a few key people and see where we can take this. I mean, yes, this, we need to continue to provide data, but We've been thinking about trying to get this on a for-service basis for years. And now is the time to move it forward and make it practical. And you payer people are going to help us do that. So there will be another meeting, a practical meeting. You know the problem. You know what can be done. And we'll move it forward. Thank you. I, I certainly can't say any more or better than that. I appreciate Dr. Dearborn's his, his guidance, uh, use of his facility, um, his energy in putting this together in a very short time. And I thank everybody who, uh, under him, who assisted in this as well, uh, as well as, as my staff. And I really appreciate everyone coming. Um, and just adding one last thing, you know, there are payers around the country who are, um, you know, who, who are doing this. And I think we may also it would be helpful to hear from them about about uh, what what pushed them uh, to make change and showing their results as well. Instead of you know you always in business always have this push pull scenario, right? And so right now we're in the push, and I think there needs to be a lot more pull because there's real evidence stating that this uh, does save money, and certainly you know on a, on a tangible level uh, we're saving a lot of lives. Um, and I think both of those uh, certainly value us getting together more often um, regularly, not only in this setting, but also around the country to figure this out and make it a reality. And so that's my challenge, my challenge to myself, to my department, to the other federal agencies here with me, and to all of you here in this room. So um, I appreciate everything that uh, we've done today, and I look forward to working with you in the next couple of months and years. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.